Hello everybody, Thersites the Historian here with Sean Chick. Today we're going to do a quick video on memoirs, movies, and novels relating to the American Civil War. Sean can tell us what he thinks about them since this is a subject he knows pretty well. And Sean, I believe you said you wanted to begin by talking about movies relating to the Civil War. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be a good one to um, good one to start off with, you know. I also, we're doing the memoirs thing because I, I meant to include it in the book video. I forgot about it, so I was like, hey, let's try to do a follow-up. And they were like, oh, let's do some movies too, you know. Um, so... Uh, we're gonna talk about the uh, talk about five movies. I mean, there's a variety of movies that um, are about the Civil War take place during it, or it's just a backdrop, like movies like Bad Company, which is a 1970s western. Civil War is the backdrop of it. So is The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. But I want to talk about ones that deal directly with the war and are actually good movies. Because you know, I can tell you some bad Civil War movies, like um, Field of the Lost Shoes. That's a pretty bad one. Um, but anyway, so let's start off with uh, talking about these five. We're do uh, Gone with the Wind, Glory, Lincoln, Gettysburg, and um, odd, an odd little movie called Pharaoh's Army, which is not very well known. That's one of my favorites. Um, uh, Derek, which of these five have you seen? I have seen Gettysburg. I've seen Glory. I'm pretty sure I've seen Gone with the Wind, but it's been a very long time. I've actually never seen Lincoln. And I've never heard of Pharaoh's Army until you mentioned it just now. Yeah, Pharaoh's Army's pretty pretty obscure, no doubt about that. But um, let's start off with Gone with the Wind. It's um, still probably the best known of them. You know, uh, Gone with the Wind has some records. Uh, adjusted for inflation, it's still the highest grossing movie ever made. A lot of that do with reissues and whatnot, but also Gone with the Wind was just such a big cultural touchstone at the time. Um, and one of the reasons I think Gone with the Wind was a big cultural touchstone, one of the reasons is because of the Great Depression. If you think about the plot for Gone with the Wind, it's about a young woman who lives in this privileged, pampered life. You know, she, you know, her father owns a plantation in Georgia, and she goes through the ravages of the Civil War, you know, the loss of some of her more innocent aspects of it, although she's not innocent. The... the one of the good things about it is it doesn't portray it as being pretty conniving. Get go. It's actually one of the reasons why I like the movie a lot. That Scarlett O'Hara, our protagonist, is not a good person. Emphatically. Okay? And so people watching that movie would have seen themselves also going through hard times. Think about it. They got that scene in Gone with the Wind where Scarlett is it's back home to Terra. It's been ravaged, although not burned by the Union. She goes to the field and she declares that she'll never go hungry again. A declaration like that meant a lot to people living through the Great Depression. You know? Mm -hmm. It also be kept in mind that in the 30s and 40s and, and into the early 50s, the number of people going to see movies is like nothing we have today. I mean, the, the people went to the... Some estimates say that 25% of all Americans every weekend went to the movies, or saw at least one movie a week. You know? um, but in many ways, movies were this extremely profitable thing, and then Gone with the Wind is the biggest hit of all of them. Uh, so Gone with the Wind itself, as far as its uh, interpretation of the war, it's considered um, uh, by, by some, especially those who haven't really paid close attention, just to be lost cause propaganda. Uh, there's some truth in that. It definitely does give a pro-Southern take on the war um, with some lost cause elements. But I'd also say the movie is very critical of the lost cause in a deep way. That is that um, Charlotte O'Hara loves Ashley Wilkes, who's the who's like the the the, the um, almost like the symbol of uh, of a Southern gallant knightly hero, the, the chivalrous one. If you know, by the end of the movie, I mean, you, you, I mean, even earlier than that, you can see that Ashley Wilkes is kind of talks out of both ends of his mouth, that he's sort of full of himself, not arrogant, but like very uh, self-absorbed, you know, and that he's the weaker one. The strong one is Rhett Butler. Rhett Butler, one of the first things we see of Rhett Butler is him criticizing South's decision to go to war, saying they're a bunch of idiots for fighting. They're all going to lose. Even says... 
This is the only thing the South has more abundance in the North is arrogance. Huh. Yeah. And like he, Rhett Butler himself constantly critiques Ashley Wilkes and talks with a gallant Mr. Wilkes and everything, you know, meant as an insult in a way. So while I do think the movie, of course, has elements of the lost cause in it, it is also in a very central way critical of the old South and the plantation culture. You know, and I, I think that's one of the things that made that, that made the movie better than other films done in a more lost cause way. In fact, it's the only movie I can think of that's in a lost cause tradition that actually still works. You know, um, and that's you know, of course, the beautiful cinematography, um, the uh, herb soundtrack. Um, not every actor is great, but several of them are. Some of the scenes are. Not just iconic, but also uh, heart wrenching. The uh, probably the most powerful one is where Scarlet goes to the train yard, while the wounded, some dead Confederates who are in the rail yard of Atlanta waiting to be pulled out. Um, I think that's one of the most powerful war scenes ever filmed. You know, a sea of wounded. You see. Um, anyway, you got any thoughts, Derek? Um, I have, I have only the vaguest recollections of that movie, actually. I don't even yeah. know if I've watched it uh, end to end before. Um, it's it's worth taking a look at. It's also fun because it is a love story between two scumbags. You oh, know, yeah. I, I I do like movies that are about people who are in love with each other, but they're either like seriously flawed, or there's just some weirdness going on. Like one of them is um, Ali Fear Eats the Soul. It's a German movie from the 1970s. And it's about this old, older German woman, older, she's like, she's almost 60, who's a cleaning lady, and she falls in love and marries a guy from North Africa in his 20s who just immigrated to Germany. Damn. And really well done. It's a beautiful, in many ways, heartbreaking movie. Um, I think that's one of the best movies I've seen about love ever. And I, one of the things I like about Gone with the Wind is that it is between two people of orally questionable character although Scarlet's definitely seems like the worst of the two you know? Brett Butler is more just a uh, devil may care I'll get paid as I need to sort of guy you know like a proto like a like Han Solo before Han Solo right I see and I mention that because like Han Solo when he needs to be heroic he'll do it it's like uh, you know a con man exterior a roguish exterior with actually a heroic center to it. ah so anyway, no, just uh, I think movies worth watching. Um, uh, some people, uh, of course, are upset with depictions of slavery, understandably so. Fairly inaccurate and cartoonish. Um, you know, some of the acting amongst the uh, black actors is outside of uh, Mammy is pretty terrible. Uh, Mammy works, I think, still. She won uh, Best Supporting Actress, actually the first black person to win an Academy and uh, Mammy's like the funniest person in there. She's also the smartest person. She'll perceive that Scarlet is full of shit, essentially, you know, <laughs> in ways other people don't. <laughs> I guess to be fair from what you're describing, it doesn't seem like uh, much of a secret that Scarlet is kind of up her own ass. Yeah, but she's so beautiful that all the guys are just love her. You know, they don't see things about her that Rhett Butler and Mammy see. They're portrayed in the movie as the two people who essentially are most in touch. It's true. Um, One's most in touch with reality. In fact, a lot of the movie is about people who are out of touch with reality. I mean, her father ends up losing his mind. Ashley Wilkes is tied to this old South ideal that is dead. People have false notions of who Scarlet is. You know? Um no, you don't watch it for an accurate depiction of slavery, you know, or even really an accurate depiction of uh, the Civil War necessarily. Although it is interesting for being known as a Civil War movie, you know, half the movie takes place during Reconstruction, and more interestingly, there are no battle scenes in the movie. Huh. You see the aftermath of war. You see the devastation. I think that's one of the things I really do also like about it is. Um, a lot of movies, I mean, you get a war movie, you see explosions, you see how war may affect the soldiers. I mean, if anything, Gone with the Wind really is about how does war affect civilians? Oh. How does it affect those 
were not on the front line. That's very rare for a war movie. I can't think of one off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure. I, I know there had to be some, of course. Oh, oh, here's one. Hope and Glory, which is about uh, a this British kid growing up during World War II. I think the opening scene of the movie is Neville Chamberlain announcing that Britain has declared war in Germany. Uh, that's a that's a good movie about the civilians being affected by war. That's a really good film too. The part where the Spitfire flies low and everybody because Spitfire is like dogfighting and Measure Schmidt flies low over the neighborhood. Absolutely beautifully shot and stunning scene. And even better when you realize that's a real Spitfire, you know, not some CGI bullshit. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could make a case that Chronicles of Narnia is also a movie about the home front. Yeah, you could, only you get to walk inside of a wardrobe and you're in another world. <laughs> yeah, you know, details. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I, I, I do have a high opinion of Gone with the Wind as as a film. Um, and I think it's, of I think one of the reasons it survived a bit longer than other ones besides filmmaking techniques is that it isn't just a wholehearted embrace of um, Lost Cause, you know. There definitely has elements in there. So, yeah, I have a very high opinion of Gone with the Wind. It's not my favorite Civil War movie. Wait, maybe it is, actually. I don't know. Pretty high up there. Well, I guess, too, uh, Gone with the Wind, that was 1935 or 6, somewhere like that? 39. Okay. 39. So, I mean, back then, if they had wanted to just go full tilt, lost cause, they probably could have gotten away with it, right? Yeah, overall. Although, I was tell to say that, um, you know, it, it might not have. It might have been less of a hit in the north, because it's not like. Um, I I do think a lot of commentators overstate how pervasive the lost cause is. If the lost cause was so pervasive. How come it's died out relatively? I want to say quickly, but easily. Push came to shove, it died off. Yeah, and that's because people in the north didn't really have a high opinion of the south or even the lost cause. So. I always disagree with David Blight and the rest who think the lost cause was embraced by the North. I don't think it ever was. I mean, I or guess it depends it was... on what part of the North you're talking about, because I feel like culturally the South is uh, includes a lot of the southern parts of the Midwestern states even. And I don't know about, say, the rural parts of Pennsylvania or New York, but possibly. Yeah, I could see some of that seeping in there, you know, but... Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've seen Confederate flags in Michigan, for instance. You know, rural parts, right? Yeah, I like to think of where where I'm at in Columbus as being the gateway between north and south in a real sense. And the reason is yeah. this. This is about as far north as you can go and get sweet tea at some restaurants. Oh, that's that oh, that's a good observation there. And it it should be noted, people in that border area did fight for the Confederacy in some cases in cases. I would estimate um uh probably a few thousand would join the Confederate Army from those border areas, especially southern Illinois. Yeah. Also weird, uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but have you ever been to Covington, which is basically the Kentucky suburb of Cincinnati? Yes. Okay, uh, maybe this is just some weird thing that happened to me because I ran into somebody who was an outlier, but I swear the local residents there have the most aggressive northern-sounding accents of anyone I've ever encountered <laughs> from anywhere in the U.S. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> and I don't know how or why, but but then if you I've get to, a little bit further north, people sound a lot more southern for some reason. Interesting. I uh, I was barely in Covington though. I mean, it's mostly you're, you're you're going through Covington on the way to Cincinnati, which really when I was in Cincinnati, I was on the way to Columbus anyway. Uh, no, that's what I want to say. Um, I think Gone with the Wind is the best Civil War movie from a pure filmmaking. As far as my favorite representation of the war. Definitely not. I see. You know, um, you know. So yeah, I think it's the best movie, film, But Civil War movie, we'll get to that as we go on. Um, but let's get to one you've actually seen because you've seen Glory, right? Yes. Yeah. So what did you think of Glory? I remember thinking of it as a pretty good movie. I mean, I, keep in mind I watched this last in high school, so my memories of it are rather fuzzy. Um, but I remember, uh, you know, being kind of struck by the idea of, you know, these black soldiers. I think, I think they depict them under a white officer, right? Or. Yeah. Which okay. would be accurate. 
Yeah, because I know like they depict this officer as being a little bit conflicted at first, and then getting into his role over time, and you know he and his men accepting each other, and then moving forward. And I think they carry some position at the end, and uh, you know they all bond together, and they make this great oh, contribution. God. Yeah, sort of. It's a little more tragic. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, um, and then some people die along the way, but you know. Uh, I mean, look, Glory is about the 54th Massachusetts, which gives people the false impression that they are the first black regiment to see major combat in the Civil War. They're not. First one is the Louisiana Native Guards at Port Hudson. Okay, but the Louisiana Native Guards weren't being followed around by the press as much. I mean, they were covered, but they didn't have that pathos of like an abolitionist leading a black regiment to battle and dying. You know what I mean? Right. The Native Guards were New Orleans free people of color, many of whom had first tried to join the Confederate Army and then ended up with the Union Army, some of them. Okay, I say that and people go like, what the hell are you talking about? Okay, New Orleans is a very different beast than the rest of the South, real quick. New Orleans was founded by the French and then ruled by the Spanish. Their ideas on slavery are more loose than the Americans. I'm giving you the simple form, but essentially... English and Dutch viewed slaves purely as property, which means they have no rights. French, and especially Spanish, view slaves as property and as Catholics. Since you are Catholic, you deserve certain rights, such as your children are not supposed to be sold off, have Sunday off, you can gain your freedom, usually through purchase, um, you can testify in court. Um, I mention this because New Orleans had a very large population of free people of color, according to the French, and especially the Spanish, made up part of the military here. They fought with the French against the Chickasaw. They fought the Spanish against the British in the American Revolution. And they fought in the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812. So those free people of color had a tradition of fighting for New Orleans. So when the Civil War starts, a lot of them formed their own regiment to join the Confederate Army. They were turned back as the Confederacy is founded the proposition of slavery and that black people are naturally inferior. They remained as a local defense unit. Well, when the Union Army took New Orleans, a portion of them, and actually not even majority, interestingly enough, most of the ones who tried to fight for the Confederacy did not end up joining the Union, but many of them did, about 150 200, and they will fight the Battle of Port Hudson. One in particular is an man named Andre Caliu. He was actually one of the only, one of the very few black officers in the Civil War, and he died at Port Hudson. Uh, anyway, a little aside there, I got to say that because glory makes you think, oh, it's the 54th. 54th is one of the first. It is not the first. The 54th Massachusetts got more heavily covered, had an abolitionist leading who died in battle, and it's got a whole movie about it, you know? Maybe a movie, make a movie called Native Guards. Maybe that can outdo Glory, right? Yeah. Uh, Glory is interesting. It's uh, very much in the just cause tradition of the war as opposed to lost cause. Now, the just cause to me is the North's interpretation of the war, which is a heroic and virtuous North smited the South. Uh, the just cause does have what I consider two different variations. And that, by the way, the lost cause also has variations as well. I don't like it when scholars try to make the lost cause sound like it's just one thing. There's several different versions of it. But for the just cause, the two different versions are the nationalist and the abolitionist. And the nationalist version has kind of been forgotten over time, and I think that's because it's become it became more of general American now. You know? The abolitionist version would go in and out of popularity. Right now it's extremely popular with uh, his and other people. So, Glory is very much in that abolitionist tradition. So, 54th Massachusetts, it's interesting. It's kind of like Full Metal Jacket for the Civil War. One half of the movie is about training the troops, and the second half is about going into the war front. And concluding with the attack on Battery Wagner, which is an abject failure, it does depict the 54th charging into the earthworks for a bit. The movie probably overstates how much damage they did, but some of them did make it up. When I say this battle was a failure, I mean, the Union lost something like 1,200 soldiers, and the Confederates lost less than 200. Uh, it's one of the most lopsided defeats in the uh, Civil War suffered by any... Um, but the 54th had charged heroically. 
they were one of the few units to actually penetrate the lines, so they attained something of a legendary status, if you Anyway, uh, Glory is a very good movie. It's pretty well acted and shot. Actually, it's very well shot. Uh, Freddie Francis did the cinematography. Uh, the battle scenes are probably still your all-around best Civil War battle day. Mm. Um, they only have two. They have a, a skirmish, and then they have, of course, the charge into the battery. Um, acting's good. Music is very beautiful as well. Probably your uh, one of your best music scores of the 80s and definitely one of the best for the Civil War. Uh, lots of stuff going on. I like the movie a lot. One of the things I do like about it is that much like Law, much like Gone with the Wind, it's not a pure distillation of the Just Cause. Because if anything, you see more Northern racism in the movie than Southern racism. Because so much of it, I mean, you know, the Confederates aren't characters; they're just guys that you shoot at them and they get shot and stuff, right? Right. You actually see, you know, the fact that the commissary won't of the black soldiers proper shoes they're being paid less money than white soldiers that when they get there they're not being sent to combat because the white officers don't trust them you know and in that regard i think that's one of the reasons that makes the movie a bit more complex and interesting than just your standard uh, just cause interpretation would allow should be noted this is this movie was my first exposure to the civil war um i saw it with my grandfather it's, it can be a very violent movie, especially the Antietam scene. That guy's head explodes. And that just shocked me. And I asked him if it was make-believe. Because I was used to movies being about fake stuff, right? Like Jaws isn't real. Right. My grandfather said, oh, no, this happened. That's when I first started to understand that there was actually a past. You know, the things that happened before I was born. You know? Uh, so anyway, Glory, very, very good movie. Um, well deserving its accolades. We'll mention one fun fact about it too. Uh, was a box office flop when it came out. Really? Yeah. Despite like all the praise thrown its way, um, a lot of the accolades it received, you know, Academy Award nominations. It was when I say a flop, though. I mean not like Adventures of Pluto Nash level flop, but not a major financial success. Sure. So one could argue the movie's kind of been remembered by critics and it's, they've kind of kept it alive, but it was never as big a crowd pleaser as um, as people think of it. Yeah, because I told it was a flop. They go like, really? It's like, yes, Glory was a flop. Uh, so anyway, those are my thoughts on Glory. You got any thoughts on it, sir? Not especially. Uh, That's one I need to rewatch. I haven't seen it since probably about 10th grade, I would say. It's been a while for me, actually a long while. I think I'm going to put it on, you know, we got a quarantine going on. I think I'm going to put on Glory in the next few weeks. And it's been long enough. Yeah, now that I think about it, it's, uh, I think the last war movie I watched was probably 1917. And uh, I usually don't rewatch war movies, actually. Huh. Hey, well, quick aside, what's your favorite war movie or one of your favorites? One of my favorites? Um... <sighs> I mean, I haven't seen this one since high school either. I really like that one scene in Gladiator uh, with the Romans deploying the field artillery against the barbarians under Marcus Aurelius. Um, Is it, was that an accurate depiction of Roman warfare? I've been told So it far wasn't. as I know, I mean, again, like I said, I haven't actually watched that scene in many years, but it's just always stuck with me. And then reading about some of these battles is not impossible. I mean, that's probably about what they would deploy that stuff like. And I think that's the only depiction I've ever seen in a movie, at least, where they actually use field artillery. Um, <coughs> yeah, so that's... They, there's another Roman one. I'm trying to think of the name of it. Because uh, the only one I can think of is Druids, which was horrid. Um, <laughs> but uh, what's the other one? Ben, uh, Ben-Hur has a naval battle scene that's pretty well done. I've actually never seen Ben-Hur. I've never finished Ben Hur. Uh, I liked what I did see of it. I, I will say that chariot race scene. I always thought it was good, and I saw it again a few years ago. Oddly enough, we turn on like our PBS station uh, years back, and for some reason, that chariot race scene would always come up. Like they always played Ben Hur a lot. But anyway, chariot race scene oh. is one of the 
finest pieces of cinema ever made. Editing is perfect. It is exciting. It is superb. Um, it, it's, you know, a lot of those movies in the 50s weren't that great at action scenes, in my opinion. That is the exception. It deserves its credit. It deserves reputation. Yeah, I have seen quite a few clips from the chariot race, for sure. I mean, that's become pretty iconic. Um, it, 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 it's, it's amazing. It's I amazing. Think, I want to say the movie I'm thinking of was uh, maybe called Centurion. Is maybe about 10 years old. Anyway, it's about a Roman who has to go north of the of Hadrian's Wall to retrieve a standard lost by his father and the legion that he oh. served with. I've seen that one. I didn't think that was very good. <laughs> that was um, very good. <laughs> I mean, I liked the uh, I liked some parts of it, especially the cinematography and um, I don't know. I actually I don't find that there are very many good ancient movies in general. I mean, certainly the Three Hundred movie was not very good. Oh, um, sucks, man. Alexander I, I just, movie kind of sucked. With um, I mean, I, I found I I found. Personally, if I know a lot about a subject, it's very hard for me to actually enjoy a movie about it. You know, I feel like there is a really good ancient history movie, and I can't think of it right now. I will say, Ben Hur off the top of my head would be one, one worth seeing. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, now that I think about it, the best ancient history movie I've ever seen is The Warriors, because that is an adaptation of Xenophon's Anabasis, but set in New yes. York. That's the best ancient well, movie I've seen. Oh, no, I've got it, man. I mean, it's not a movie, but Rome, the TV show. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, I wouldn't say it's perfect. I remember... I, the, fucking, being, lo- I fucking loved it, man. I remember... <laughs> yeah. uh, there are a few parts that uh, I wasn't too keen on. I think they probably make Antony a little too dumb. And Maybe. They make Caesar a little too harsh because Caesar was known for his generosity and that's how he won over so many friends. So there are a few depictions I'm a little iffy on. And then Augustus was known, especially later, for being very charming and very able to win support, but they made him come off like Mark Zuckerberg-esque, so he just came across as creepy. Uh, so, I mean... The so- thing is, you say that, I'd always remembered reading about Augustus being like that, actually, like being kind of like a cold ish like more of a i mean like you know a very canny politician of course but not super charismatic well i guess i guess i'm thinking mostly of the older augustus maybe he evolved over time but uh the big, i can see the that big complaint among the senators especially in book one of tacitus's and Ollie's, is that augustus while he was very subtle and charming and never forceful he would always make clear what he wanted because you know the the sort of way the government ran is that he would hint to officials, all right, here's going to here's going to be how the next election turns out, and here's what I want to see happen. But he would but do, do it in a way where it'd be a suggestion, and that way they could propose it, but know that he's behind it. So it's like this yeah. weird system of um, hints, but it's understood who's in charge, but they none of them um, are outraged with indignity because they um, are forced to do something. So they're acting as equals, even though he's the first among the equals because he makes all the actual decisions, but then they agree with him. Uh, When Tiberius tries to be a little too deferential and he won't really say what he wants, and they'll ask him questions like, please just tell us what the fuck you want, because we know that if we say the wrong thing and you disagree with it, you'll think that we're being disloyal and we might get executed for it. Our lives in your hands, just tell us what the fuck you want. Yeah, and he can never quite master that. That's actually why Tiberius sucked as emperor, because he he was not very good at the whole hint system, because he did not have mm-hmm. Augustus's social grace. Do well, you think Tiberius was a terrible emperor? Um, he, I think he had the skills to be an emperor. The problem is the way that Augustus set up the communication between the emperor and, and the senate was set up where it works for one man's personality really well. But keep in mind, Augustus appointed half the guys in the senate. Because, you know, most of them died in the Civil War, many by his own hand, and he got to appoint all the replacements. So, I will say all of them were loyal to him. But then Tiberius is just his dickhead son-in-law, who uh, was not his designated heir. He's already a middle-aged man, very grumpy, set in his ways. Um, and he also didn't really want to be emperor either, so that was all going against him. Yeah, I, I um, remembered uh, when I got my master's degree 
you know, I had the, uh, you know, they, they ask you the questions, the thing, which his name got, you know. Um, and the guy actually asked me a question about Augustus, almost insinuating, like, Augustus' biggest failure was Tiberius. And I was like, no, he wasn't. <laughs> Although Tiberius is a very good ruler. He was the best or, He was the best choice available, for sure. I mean, he was the only person with the experience to keep the Empire running. And for I mean, the most Rome's, part, he was successful. Yeah, Rome's stable. No big, giant civil wars or anything. Um, you know, you had some issues, it's, some issues with Janus, but that's just court politics, you know? Well, I guess a lot of it, too, you can divide Tiberius's reign in half around the year 26. Before 26, okay. he does fairly well. I mean, sure, there are problems where, when he doesn't communicate well, and there are indications that he's growing suspicious of people around him, and there were rumors that he had his nephew Germanicus killed. Um, unsubstantiated, of course, but still. Um and he just wasn't very popular. And then, as he gets older, he has no one to pass on the burden to because the son Drusus also dies. Germanicus is dead, and the you know Germanicus's son, who later becomes Caligula, is a child. So Tiberius has to keep going, but he's exhausted. He retreats to Capri and then puts Sejanus in charge. And he also believes that everyone's plotting against his throne. So that's when the treason trials start. That being said, yeah. this was a problem for the Senate. The Empire itself did fine. So it depends yeah, that's on what you're... Like, yeah. I, 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 it's kind of like my opinion of Caligula, where like I'm like, okay, who's negatively infect, affected? The people who write the histories. Yeah, the 600 like men in the Senate. That's it. Like everybody else in the Empire is doing fine under uh, Tiberius and Caligula, you know? Yeah. Do you know me? I kind of I think a lot of Caligula stuff might have been overstated to um, essentially... Um, um, Make the his assassination to give it a moral justification. You know, yeah, because I, I mean that the whole twist of he was crazy. He was going to make his horse consul. No, he's just being a dick. He was being sarcastic because he was pointing out that the Senate had become so obsequious that they were just sucking up. And yeah, they were just. Thing, he was just making was, fun of how useless they were. Which I, I I I'm just totally sympathetic to. I mean, Caligula is like. Uh, I mean, dude, Caligula had done great on the internet. <laughs> no, he would have, and also a lot of it was he had just recovered from a major illness, and they had been talking about who to appoint as his replacement. And in his mind, he's like, "Oh wait, they don't mean any of the things they say to me when they say that they support me and believe in me and all this." And every time they say they don't have any ideas, they don't know what to advise me, and they're waiting for me to come up with an idea. Well, apparently, if I'm sick or dying, then suddenly they're just full of ideas. So. Clearly, they're holding out on me with this. I need to provoke them to speak their minds. I want you to tell me what you guys think. You're supposed to be my advisors. All of you have more experience than me. I'm in my 20s. You're all ex men of many years of experience. Can you not give me any advice? Because you seem to be full of it when I was about to die. So what the fuck gives? And so I'm actually 100% on Caligula's side. I think he had a valid point. Got your next video, man. You need to do a. You need to hurry up and just do a Caligula video and get it over with. <laughs> I mean, I will eventually. I'm planning on uh, doing a extending the Emperor series back in time all the way to Augustus, and then um, going forward all the way to Constantine the Eleventh. But it'll be a long time before I actually complete all that. That'd be amazing labor of love, man. Would love, um, really love to tune in on those. But um, let's get let, let, let's get away from the Roman Empire and go back to the American. War. <laughs> All right, so yeah, a couple, you know, about two thousand years difference, give or take. Yeah, two thousand years uh, difference, you know. Yeah, not uh, a big no, deal. Uh, no, but glory, I can highly recommend. Uh, I think it is. Uh, I mean, I mean, all honestly, all these movies I'm going over, I like all of them. Right. The weaknesses with all of them too. Uh, one, the critiques of glory, I do want to mention, and Roger Ebert wrote this one in because he would, uh, because. Roger Ebert as a film critic is interesting. He had two obsessions, sex and racism. If a movie had a woman getting naked, nine times out of ten he would approve it. And if a movie dealt with racial issues, he would almost always like it. Including some ham-fisted shit fests. As far as the um, thing with Glory is, when he wrote, he said he liked the movie, but he said it was too much about white officers and white saviors. And I'm like, dude... The officers are white. You know, Robert Gould Shaw is interesting. We also have Robert Gould Shaw's letters. Right. So we have a we have a we have a pathway into him. He's an interesting figure, you know. Um and um 
you know, there are those who are just obsessed with the uh, the critiquing the idea of the white savior, and I get it too. Like, I mean, one of the things I didn't like about the Game of Thrones TV show, even back when everybody liked it, was that Daenerys was portrayed as this kind of white savior, and I, I didn't like it. I thought it was corny and overdone. But with Glory, I'm like, that's the history of it. And Robert Gould Shaw comes from an abolitionist family. He's a dyed in the wool abolitionist. He's all about this stuff. Yeah, not only that, but um. Like like you said, you have to kind of go with where you have your sources. And I think a lot of people who aren't in the history field don't get that sometimes. I mean, uh, yeah, the- part of the reason why I do biographies of prominent consuls or emperors is because have you ever tried to do a biography of a random common person from antiquity? Well, guess what? You can't. The, the information isn't there. So this isn't like the cheese and the worms? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we don't have the kind of documentation you have even in the early modern period. It simply isn't there. If we were to do something of that nature, it would be very much in general terms. There there would be no biography in the proper sense. That's why it's good to get into the Civil War, too, because it's a literate society, north and south. So you get letters and memoirs from common soldiers. It's a great, and you you know, but even the Napoleonic and the, Wars in the French Revolution, it's rare to get anything, and it's almost impossible to get anything for the Seven Years' War. Yeah. You know, let alone War of the Spanish Succession. So, Civil War, you just have this abundance of soldier rec- recollections, you know? Right. No, Glory, good flick. Definitely recommend it. Here's another one we'll go over, though, is Lincoln, which is also very much in the Just Cause tradition. Uh, Lincoln also, by the way, had was also criticized as being kind of a white savior movie because there are no black characters in the movie except for uh, Housekeeper. That's it. So they even put oh, Frederick Douglass in it? Frederick Douglass is not really in it. Hmm. But here's the thing about Lincoln. So one of the things I said about Lincoln is that Spielberg was looking to make a Lincoln movie, right? And he hires the uh, playwright uh, Tony Kushner, who actually grew up in West Louisiana, by the way. Um... Tony Kushner is famous for Angels in America. Um, Angels in America, I think, is one of the best uh, examples of, like, leftist art seating. I say that because a lot of times when art has more of a political slant, I like it. They're talking about a heavy slant, right? Right. But I thought Tony Kushner is a good writer. He wrote an entire... Lincoln script that has spanned his whole life. It would have been a TV miniseries. He picked out specifically Lincoln trying to pass the 13th Amendment that ended slavery. The movie totally takes part in January and February of 1865. There are some contrived aspects to Lincoln, of course, with the plot, but of all the Civil War movies I'm talking about, this is overall the most accurate. I'll, I will, I will be, I'll be straight. I am not an expert on the 13th Amendment, how it was passed exactly. Um, Overall, the Lincoln movie, though I've been told, is accurate to it. It has a few exaggerations here and there, such as there's some political um, corruption in the movie with a certain group uh, led by uh, David Spade, and which is James Spader. I said David Spade. (laughs) As I was going to say, man, that's that's a bold choice for a serious drama. James Spader, who's fucking great. He's he's great in the movie. He, I mean, his character is like some like a Southern Unionist, and he works as like a political operative who will buy people off. That's their role. They did buy some people off to pass the Thirteenth Amendment, but their role is overplayed in the movie. For sure. But anyway, the point is the degree to which Frederick Douglass is involved in the actual passage of the Thirteenth Amendment, I can't speak to. I can say that the movie is a good distillation of Abraham Lincoln, both his personal life, his relation with his with his son, and with his wife Mary Todd, of course, uh, with the various political figures. They casted the movie well. The actors do fantastic. Tommy Lee Jones plays Thaddeus Stevens and gives, I think, the best performance of his career. Um, the movie's well shot, um, sharply written. Talks about a lot of the issues of the war, not just involving the end of slavery, but the nature of politics and how Lincoln is caught between conservative and radical forces. And kind of the argument between these forces. And while the Confederates are barely in it, I would say they probably have the best scene in the movie, my favorite scene, which is when Lincoln 
talks with the peace commission that Jefferson Davis sent. Now, Jefferson Davis actually didn't want peace. He did this to mollify the Confederate Congress. He sent three figures in, one of which was Alexander Stevens, his vice president. They both, these, these two guys hate each other, by the way. And Stevens and Lincoln have a discussion about about the war. And, you know, Lincoln's like, hey, slavery is going to end anyway. And Stevens is like, well, what are we going to make of this? Saying that their society's over. And Lincoln says, well, I mean, you should give up. And then Lincoln says that they triumph justly. And they, the Confederate guy says, one of the Confederate guys says, come now. We've only triumphed because you defeated us in the battlefield. <laughs> and Stevens has the line in the movie where he says, your union is bonded in cannon fire and and I think that really speaks to how no matter no matter the degree to which the North and South are reunified by the war, it's always going to be in perfect reunion because it is bonded by cannon fire and death. Hmm. Anyway, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, of course, plays Abraham Lincoln. His performance won Best Actor, and he definitely deserved it. I forgot it was him, and I just thought it was Lincoln. Pulled it off magnificently. Yeah, Daniel Day uh, Lewis is a hell of an actor for sure. Would say this movie more than any other it's into the just cause name. I mean, you've got some racist North stuff in there that they explore a bit, but it's not really in there too much. Um You know, you're not gonna get into the darker aspects of Lincoln as a man beyond the fact that he definitely suffered from depression had an unusual relationship with his wife. But no, overall, just beautifully shot. I mean, Steven Spielberg is a genius, one of my favorite filmmakers, you know. Um, very superbly done movie. Um, would it be my favorite Civil War movie? Probably my second favorite. And I think it's because the movie, uh, how am I going to say this? It doesn't... Um, it doesn't dumb things down for the audience. Like, there's actually a whole scene where Lincoln talks about the legal designation of slaves as contraband. And I'm watching the scene, and I'm like, this is amazing, because he's he's talking like Lincoln the lawyer, and Lincoln, first and foremost, above all things, is a lawyer. His bones. He thinks like a lawyer, he acts like a lawyer, he writes like a lawyer. You know? So... He's going into this lawyerly discussion about how he wants to free the slaves because if we view them only as contraband, we're still viewing them as property and we need to free them before the war is over. And it's just, this whole speech is amazing, but it's also highly intelligent. I kept looking at it being like, this is one of the most, one of the most intellectual, jargon-ridden things I've ever seen in the movie. It's beautifully pulled off, you know? Yeah. It really impressed me because, you know, Spielberg... Many people still has this people have this false idea that Spielberg's like you know somebody's like he knows what's popular and he dumbs it down for his audience. I'm like, yeah, Spielberg does have some movies where he's corny. He does like if he has any weakness, it's that sometimes movies go into the corny. But Spielberg can surprise you with how intelligent he can be and when his teeth are out. Sometimes Spielberg doesn't fuck around. Great example is Jaws, right? Watching Jaws with somebody I was dating years back, and you know like. Um, you know, the whole time of most of the movie, she was like, I know what's going to happen. I mean, movies are predictable. And then the shark eats the kid in the first few minutes. She's like, oh, I didn't see that happening. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, shark doesn't just, the shark doesn't just eat the kid in Jaws. There's a blood fountain gushing up. <laughs> and you see the kid being pulled down, screaming as he's dying. Like, yes, Lincoln a lot. I mean, I'm sorry, not Lincoln. I mean, Spielberg a lot of times can be corny and pull his punches. But when Spielberg chooses not to fuck around is as hardcore as uh, Kubrick or anybody else, you know? Right. And uh, in the case of Lincoln, there's even a scene like that. They show, like, the amputated arms being just tossed out of the hospital. You know, it's almost as ghastly and in, as the sweeping shot of all the wounded and gone with the wind, you know? So, yeah, Lincoln, think very highly of it. One of Spielberg's best, one of the best on this list. And I haven't seen that in a few years. I better watch Lincoln again, too. <laughs> yeah, I guess I need to watch that. I just watched uh, There Will Be Blood fairly recently, and I was really uh, taken with Daniel Day-Lewis's acting in that one. Yeah, I I'm not a big fan of that movie, but Daniel Day-Lewis's acting was superb. And, of course, the last 20, 15, 20 minutes is for gold. Oh, yeah, you that, know? That, the, even that bowling alley scene? 
Yes, that's pure gold. Oh, pure no, gold. that is. That was, uh, because I didn't know that that was going to be the end of the movie, because at first it starts off kind of weird, and then it just becomes one of the best things ever. Yeah, but it, I, I gotta say, what's weird about the movie is I actually don't like the movie until the end. <laughs> yeah, like, I was, um, I mean, I was kind of on the fence about the movie. I, I wish it had been more like the end, the whole thing. Well, that's Paul Thomas Anderson for you. Like, his, his first two or three movies, he got Hard Eight, Boogie Nights, and, um... Magnolia, and I think all three of those are very good. Boogie Nights is superb. For some reason, after he did Magnolia, which I also really like, but after he did Magnolia, he just decided his movies need to be weird and boring and esoteric. The thing is, even movies I don't like by him, like he did like um, Parent Vice, terrible fucking movie, but there's just one scene that is absolutely perfect pisses me off because i'll watch it and i'll be like you could have been a great director instead you make like bad art movies most you know that anyway that's that's my that's my opinion there <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the ending part of there will be blood is fucking gold <laughs> so vice you're talking about that fairly recent movie about dick cheney oh inherent vice oh inherent vice okay yeah actually that movie the, the vice with dick cheney i did not like that movie that was a missed opportunity yeah, uh, I feel like uh, there were some misses there. I feel like they kind of pre-apologized for it at the beginning because they're talking about how hard it is to reconstruct Dick Cheney's life as if it's you know he's like some ancient figure or something. And I thought, oh no, so they had research difficulties, but they had millions of dollars to spend. That's not a good. Like, that's not. That's not good. I liked aspects of it, but my two problems with it is that the the Republicans were kind of like cartoon villains sometimes, and I was like. So what are they going to do? Like tie a woman to a railroad track or something, you know? Yeah. And my other problem is that movie doesn't get to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is that, yes, Dick Cheney did these terrible things that create the world we live in. And Obama signed off on it. Yeah. Because Obama is only shows in the movie briefly, but he's almost depicted as like a repudiation of Cheney. It's like, no, he's not. He's continued most of what Dick Cheney did, you know? Friends with bankers... And Dick Cheney um, basically said, even though he did, he always would go in the media and push Obama to be harder. He told people not to worry; Obama won't undo all the stuff we set up. That's basically what he told everybody. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because it, in some regards, I don't think the movie had the proper respect for for Dick Cheney in a way. I mean, Dick Cheney's a guy I agree with on almost nothing, right? But right. man is intelligent, willful. And he understands a darker side to things that some people are not willing to admit, you know? So, yeah. So, I, I thought the movie failed to get to the heart of the matter. And uh, pretty weak shit, especially since that director uh, has done some great stuff. Like, um, he did the Anchorman movies, which are great. And, of course, um, um, the movie about the financial crash. What Christian Bale. What was that called again? Um, Big, yeah. Big Short. Yes, that was That's a good excellent. movie. That's a superb movie. Yeah, yeah um, let's go. Well, go ahead. Sorry, Spe man. Speaking of uh, times where you've had a director who specializes in comedy and he goes into a different genre, I think uh, Todd Phillips has shown recently that he's capable of transcending genre as a director. Because, you know, Todd he did Phillips. The Hangover and then he did Joker this past year. Oh, yeah. His thing with Joker is he said, let's sneak an art movie into a comic book movie. Uh, Joker was amazing, man. Especially if you've watched as many movies as I have, you get all the references. And I say all the references because people would be like, well, obviously, this movie is just Taxi Driver and the King of Comedy. I'm like, dude, there are so many references. Like, there's references to The Exorcist. And you can just, just the shots, you know what I mean? So, I mean, if, if you're really into the history of film, you know, Joker just adds an extra layer of nerd fun for you, you know? <laughs> yeah, and it also yeah. was a very um, striking movie. Uh, I mean, it's, it sticks with you much better than most movies, I think. Definitely. And, you know, as a quick aside, I think, like, all your jokers that were really good, like, you know, Heath Ledger, Jack Nicholson, Joaquin, um, they all had iconic moves. The whole thing where he's dancing down the stairs after he kills that one guy, fucking perfect. Oh, it was. Um, also, uh, I guess you might have noticed, there was definitely a trend last year for films that focus on class exploitation and inequality. There was Joker, the South Korean film Parasite, which won, you know, film of the year, and yeah. there were two others. One of them, I think, focused on a girl, and the other one, I don't remember the main character, but a different identity altogether. 
Anyway, I mean, they all have kind of a very similar message about people who are marginalized and disenfranchised. And I just found it interesting that uh, so many different directors and writers were more or less on the same page about where we stand as a society at the same exact moment. Yeah, the people. some people have noted that as well. I mean, a lot of your more um, identity politics-driven cinema flopped and ones that have more of a class message to see. But hey, let's... Let's not derail us into a political discussion. <laughs> no, I wasn't let's, going get to say, to. let's get to say non-political, the Civil War. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the Civil War has no political dimensions whatsoever. So now we're going to get into Gettysburg. And Gettysburg is your perfect, almost flawless distillation of what I call the reconciliation. That's the idea that North and South fought each other. Yeah, it sucked. But we came together at the end. Both sides, I mean, the North was right, but both sides were heroic, so honor the South for being heroic. We got back, to, we got together at the end, and you know what? America's awesome, because you know, we won a, We won the Cold War. We won World War II. We sometimes think we won World War I, even though we didn't. Uh, you know, this sort of idea. And a lot of, most Civil War movies have been done actually in the Reconciliation, I would argue. Gettysburg is the only one that I think is actually good. Although Gettysburg is interesting because it just it, it veers almost into being really corny and bad. Yeah. Like it just, but it, it's always in this. It's almost always in this knife edge. But so, what saves Gettysburg? What what prevents it from being so corny? I mean, for prevents it from being like just a terrible movie because it could have been. I always feel like Gettysburg is almost a bad movie, yet it's not, and it works. One of the reasons is the acting. Tom Berenger, Sam Elliott, Jeff Daniels, they all really got into character, and you can see it. Stephen Lang as Pickett is superb. Got into character. They dove in, and they pulled it off. Um, you know, Sam Elliott in particular, like, purposely, actually, if you look at all the uniforms in the movie, the uniforms all look kind of nice. Sam Elliott's the, one of the only uniforms that's dusty. And she talked to a reenactor. He said, how do I make my uniform look like I've been riding a horse for and he did that himself. Um, so what, uh, who who did Sam Elliott play again? He plays uh, John Buford, the uh, the, oh, the, the cavalry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So these actors dove headfirst into their roles. Uh, the cinematography is good. Sometimes very good. Not nearly as good as like uh, Glory or Gone with the Wind, but it's it's good. It's got its moments for sure. Uh, the soundtrack is very good too, which is weird because the soundtrack's like synth music in a way. You know, but well, I mean, it, it, it was the early '90s. Yeah, but it works. I, I, I mean, like it, it's a really good soundtrack. What's weird about the Gettysburg soundtrack is that I, I, people had heard it, and I've had people be like, "That's a good soundtrack." People aren't haven't seen haven't even seen the movie. So I think it's like one of the best synth soundtracks ever made in a way. Um, one other one would be Twin Peaks because uh, I watched that recently with Tina, and she actually went out and got the album for that. Or I feel like I feel like Gettysburg is like a mix of synth and real. You know, I can't speak yeah. to Twin Peaks. It also helps that Gettysburg is a pretty faithful retelling of the novel The Killer Angel. Gettysburg, from the point of view predominantly of Lee. Robert E. Lee, James Longstreet, John Buford, and Joshua Chamberlain. Some other characters thrown in, like, you know, you get Lou Armistead and a few other guys here and there, but it's mostly those four. Yeah, I, I think uh, Gettysburg, probably the first war movie I ever saw as a kid. What did you, what did you think of it? Um, I mean, I was pretty blown away by it, when, I, especially when I was a kid, because uh, it was on such an epic scale, and... Uh, it just seemed real in a way that other movies I had seen before that, and even a lot of the ones I saw after didn't. Um, yeah, the, the battle the battle scenes are fascinating in that regard because, like, the real thing in a way. Because in one sense, you get a grand, you get the sense of the grandeur of a civil war battle, and you could never do that now. Reenacting is dying off. Yeah, it's dying hard. You know, people don't really care about the past too much. Um, Kind of like uh, I kind of say like uh, you know, things military have gone out of fashion. It's the Iraq War in large part, and I see people don't care about the past. I mean, America's past is not like glorified and thumped about the way it used to be. Because we're a declining, 
We're, we're, we're a declining civilization, a decaying civilization. Decaying civilizations hate them. So reenacting is just not a big deal. Or not into also it's expensive. We don't want to have money right now, you know? Um, so they could do that in the nineties though, when reenacting was at its height. You could line up thousands of reenactors and have a march, and they know how to march. The only problem is with Gettysburg is two things. One, they're not able to have the blood of the back. Like guys get shot and they fall. You don't get that idea of like, you know, blood soaked fields. Also, reenactors pretty well fed. You're watching the movie and you're like, man, the Confederate Army's got a lot of beer guts. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I remember, I mean, when, remember when we went to Perryville and um, yeah. like three quarters of the Confederate reenactors were too fat to actually march and fight. So they just sat around campfires and got drunk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah like like uh, there was actually, uh, somebody mentioned this about the movie uh, Cold Mountain, which we're not talking on this one. I think, actually think Cold Mountain's a pretty good movie. Looks better though. The movie Cold Mountain starts with the Battle of the Crater, and Cold Mountain was part was filmed like in East Europe. So the Confederate soldiers they got were Europeans, and Europeans are thinner, so they actually look more like what Confederates would look like. Yeah, that makes Most sense. Of, like, you know, middle-aged, fat. Well, not really fat, but middle-aged, kind of pudgy guys running around in Confederate uniforms. So Gettysburg feels both real and unreal in its battle scenes. Yeah, I guess it's too, like, you know, the park videos they show at a lot of battlefields where most, a lot of them were made in the 50s or whatever. Um, so I guess, you know, people are quite a bit thinner and smaller in general. But yeah. uh, a lot of them are just way too clean shaven and neat. By the way, that's over, man. I don't think there's any park that shows 50s videos anymore. I remember, we, remember we went to Shiloh and saw that video there? Yeah, and it, it was funny because the guy playing Grant looked like somebody who had, uh, like, glued hair onto his face. And I remember my comment is that he looks like somebody doing an impression of you doing an impression of Grant, more so than Grant. <laughs> because you could tell that was not a real beard. It didn't look... Yeah, even, even with the low-res <laughs> film, that was the fakest beard I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, no, I, uh, that was terrible, man. Uh, Eddiesburg has a lot of fake beards, of course. Uh, some are pulled off better than others. Um... A lot of people do not like Martin Sheen as Robert E. Lee. I think he turned in a mixed performance, and I really do mean mixed, because there were scenes where he didn't pull it off at all. And there were other scenes where I thought Martin Sheen was absolutely perfect. Particularly in his scene where he, he talks with Jeb Stewart after Jeb Stewart returned. Yes, that, that was a good scene. So it's weird. There would be these moments where I'd be like, man, Martin Sheen has nailed this. And I'd be like, no, he hasn't. Yeah, so it's, I think my critique would be um, I don't think his accent was quite right. His accent was the worst part of his acting for sure. General Longstreet. Yeah. He he couldn't quite do it. Now, Bear, Tom Berenger's was fucking flawless. Wait, who did he play? <laughs> Longstreet. Oh, okay. Yeah, he seemed yeah. much more like a real person. Uh, then again, I guess the, there might have been a little bit of a difference between accents in that period and accents now, but still like Martin Sheen's accent in that movie sounded like a really bad impression of a Southerner. It had, there was no way a real human could talk like that. Fun fact too, uh, Tom Berenger considers Longstreet his best role, best performance. I'm actually not familiar with any of his other work. So he might be, did he play snipe, the sniper character and something? Yeah, he was a sniper. Okay. Yeah. His Longstreet performance is better than that for sure. Definitely, yeah, sniper's terrible. But uh, <laughs> no, Tom, no, Tom Berenger was a, is a good actor. Um, probably his best known movie role is in Platoon, where he plays uh, Sergeant Barnes, Bob Barnes. And great war movie, one of my favorites. Um, and you know, Tom Berenger is superb in Platoon. Uh, I think I think Platoon he got nominated for an Academy Award. He didn't get it though. I think for him to say that that one's better than Platoon. That's some pretty heavy stuff for him, at least, actor. But he did. He pulled off Longstreet superbly. Jeff Daniels is great as Chamberlain. I think I've read, too, that Ch that uh, Jeff Daniels considered that, like, one of, if not his best role. I don't know of his best, but definitely one of his best. Like, Jeff Daniels also really got into that role. So, uh, I like Gettysburg a lot. It's it's very quotable. Actors sell it. It's got good music. It's overall well shot. And the way they say things, it's relatable enough, but it's archaic enough to where you know you're in the past. 
Yes. Which is something I really like in movies. I, I don't like it when you when you're watching a movie set in the past and you're like, wait, nobody would say that kind of shit. Like, okay, watching. All right, I, I know it's not. I, I know I'm talking like not the past, but okay, I was watching. Um, and gave me the Lord of the Rings on Blu-ray, so I'm rewatching the trilogy while I'm going through stuff, you know, the apartment. And you know, overall, most of what they say sounds like something Tolkien would write, and sounds like an epic. Then there's this one scene in the Extended Two Towers where Gimli uses the word "nervous system." I'm like, "Nervous system." <laughs> a character in, an, in like in like a like a fantasy ancient epic does not use the words nervous system. You know? And then again, I mean, maybe the dwarves have a lot of advanced science because of all the mining they do. Maybe they have to, they have some more advanced engineering and biology than you know of. Yeah, I will say as a quick aside, you said that some of the characters in Rome didn't come across that well, and I agree with you. I wasn't as big on the depiction of Caesar in Rome. Um, but, you know, I'm watching watching Lord of the Rings and I'm comparing it to the book and I'm thinking about how many of the depictions in that movie are not what they are in the book. Yeah, don't be wrong. I like the movies a lot, but you know, um, in the book, Inathor is more of a tragic character, and the movie is just a disgusting old man who eats really like horribly. So you think he's more disgusting, you know? And Gimli in the books is like kind of a grim, serious warrior, and the movie is just like shitty um, comedy, like shitty uh, comic relief. Yeah, he definitely comes across as goofy in the movies to some extent. Like he He's and uh, so not goofy in the books. Yeah, he and Legolas are kind of like having this friendly competition. Like, oh, let's see who can bag more bad guys. Yeah, it you know stuff like that. I mean, some of them are actually I think better though. I, I actually think Aragorn's better in the movies than the books. In the books, Aragorn's me like, yes, I'm a hero. I'm to be king. In the movie, he's like questioning himself. He's a man, and maybe he'll like do the same thing as Sildor did and take the ring. Is he worthy to be king? I, I like that better. Whereas in the mo- in the books, I thought Aragorn was fucking boring. <laughs> I thought he was the dullest character in the book. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm inclined to agree, I think. So it's, it's weird. Like, I'm watching the movie. I'm like, some of the characters I think are better in the movie, and some are way better in the books. Like, uh, yeah. Denethor is better in the books. Sam is better in the books. Not that Sam's great in the books, but, man, Sean Astin, like, sometimes I hit skip for some of his big scenes. <laughs> He's so goddamn corny. No, actually, uh, my least favorite part of the Lord of the Rings trilogy are the parts focused on the hobbits. In yeah. general, I I don't I actually don't like the ring chase part of it, which is part of why when we played that Lord of the Rings board game, uh, that's why you know when me and Danny were talking. I'm like, let's just you know do some military stuff. I don't care about the ring. Let's just crush their asses. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't. I find I found the ring storyline to be completely boring. I like the Hobbit. I actually like I, I I like Hobbits, man. I like Hobbits. You know. Um. I, yeah. I, I also read the Hobbit. Uh. After I read Lord of the Rings, and it was decent, but I didn't really get that into it. I tried to read the Silmarillion, but that one I only got through about twenty pages, and I quit. It does get better as it goes on. Um. I love the Silmarillion, but I also know that it is a pain in the ass. Well, I, I don't know. I feel like. Especially now that I'm aware of things like Game of Thrones, I feel like my problem with Lord of the Rings is that to me it feels a little too fifties and a little too sexless and bloodless. Yeah, I, well, I think uh, I I just kind of view it as something done that epic, mythical tradition, right? And right. which I love. I love Beowulf, Song of Roland, the Iliad. Um, I'm, I'm going to go read the Bible next year, and I'm going to treat it almost the same way. You know, I can't wait to get books. I can't wait to get to books like Maccabees, where there's lots of bloodshed. You know? Yeah, are you going to read through Numbers and uh, all the enumerated laws? Yeah, why not? Because I'll be like, uh huh, uh huh. Then I'll be like, holy shit, that's a law. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are extraordinarily specific. Yeah, actually, I think that I think I might get a kick out of Leviticus. But all right, let's leave the Bible behind. Get back to the Civil War. I mean, a lot of sides, which is not really a problem. But yeah, people have so, literally have nothing better to do right now than to listen to our sides. True, man. Well, some people have probably turned off already. But what the fuck ever. But oh, the fun ones fact- who are still listening, they have nothing better to do. Fun political fact about Gettysburg, directed by Ronald F. Maxwell, who is like one of probably three right-wing directors 
uh, along with John Milius and somebody else, probably Clint Eastwood. Uh, there we go, Clint Eastwood. So there we got three that went three that we know of. Okay, which is funny because I like all three of them as directors. Yeah, I love Clint Eastwood. He's uh, one of the most talented people in Hollywood, both as an actor and as a director. Yeah, definitely love Clint Eastwood. Hell, Outlaw Josie Wales. I can't really count as a Civil War movie, but I love it. It's a great fucking western. It's uh, one of my dad's favorite movies of all time. It's it's good, man. I mean, it's got it's got it's it's got some corny lost cause elements in there. You know, like some lines that are kind of bad, but uh, overall, I think it's a great one. But no. Ronald F. Maxwell was actually integral in the fall of Eric. Really? He lives in Virginia. He did not like Eric Cantor, and he was the guy who... He's one of the first guys to support the man who overthrew Cantor's name. I don't remember. Huh. Uh, Side note, if Cantor hadn't lost that election, he would have become Speaker after Boehner retired rather than Paul Ryan. Oh, yeah. Huh? So uh, he oh. actually prevented a Speaker of the House from coming to uh, office, which makes him historically significant uh, in general. It, that was a historically significant um, election. It was it was a big shock, and they nailed Cantor on immigration. Prelude to Trump. But like I said, uh, the interview with Ann Coulter that she did for um, Frontline that you should listen to, it's her talking for an hour, but... You want to get like insider information on like how Republicans think and other stuff. That was a really good interview. But anyway, uh, getting back to Gettysburg, good film. Definitely recommend it. Very long movie. Um, some people might think it as being a bit corny and sentimental, but it should be kept in mind that these people were or are be compared to us corny and sentimental in many ways. In other ways, they wouldn't be though. Which is the same thing with us. They would probably look at us and think certain things we do are corny and sentimental and other things are not. But humans are. Right. So, Eddiesburg I can recommend. And then I'll get to my last one here. Arrow's Army. Which was a very, very small film. Uh, the guy who directed it essentially did almost nothing after it. Arrow's Army only has about six or seven characters so what it's about is a woman is in Kentucky, area that's divided between North and South. Her husband is fighting the Confederate Army. It's implied that he dies at Shiloh. And the movie starts with something very stark. He, her daughter dies and she has to bury her daughter. Because she's a Confederate, Union people in town dig up her daughter's body and chuck it out of the coffin. Damn. Just go to the cemetery get the daughter's body, and then bury it on her property. So this movie really isn't about the civil... This isn't like Lincoln where there's grand ideas. This isn't Gettysburg where there's grand battles and lines. And you know, there are no inspirational speeches like in Glory or Gettysburg. And certainly this isn't about plantation owners. This is about hard, scrabble people living on the fringes of society, getting hurt by this war in a very personal way. What happens on her farm is that she gets visited by some Union foragers who have been sent to acquire supplies. But while they're there, one of their guys gets wounded, so they got to stay until he feels better before they can get out. And it's about the relationship between the characters and the antagonisms between them. And this really is the Civil War on a personal scale. It's a very bitter movie. It really enunciates what I call the tragic vision of the war. And fun fact about it, too, this is one of the first uh, roles for both Chris Cooper and Patricia Clarkson. Their acting in the movie is fantastic. And actually, their acting in the movie, even though the movie wasn't a big hit, people who saw the movie were so impressed. That's one of the reasons they got more roles as their careers went on, especially Cooper. Cooper actually got a starring role in a movie two years after this based on performance in Pharaoh's Army. He plays the union officer. Clarkson, he plays the uh, the better wife whose husband is away in the army. So, well, it's a superbly done movie for the most part. I give it some caveats, though, some problems. Not super well shot. The music is weird in that sometimes it works very well, and other times you're like, this is a bad score. Where the movie works is in the writing is good and the acting is stellar. 
Uh, one of my favorite scenes is when Chris Cooper is talking to another guy about why they joined the army. And the other guy says, oh, I joined for adventure. I was not doing much in Chicago anyway. I said, fuck it, let's join the army. Chris Cooper says he joined because the preacher showed him an escaped slave, showed him the whips, scars on the back, right? I got to I gotta go there and set things right. And then he muses, and here I am, killing chickens. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, you get that more than any other movie I've spoken about. This one really does speak to some of the cynicism that would be born out of the experience of war. If I have any problem with a lot of Civil War movies and Civil War scholarship, is it doesn't understand that cynicism you know, that there's still this attempt, whether there's loss or just cause, find some deeper meaning in it, and I can't blame them for that. And there are deeper meanings in it, but there is also cynicism that war created you know that you could only free slaves unite the country through mass blood so valor for confederates at least their valor wasn't enough it was, you know, the devastation left so i think pharaoh's army doesn't fit into any traditional narratives out of the war instead i think it fits more into the um the eternal truth that War is a horrible process, one that creates morally questionable moments. Because there's going to be a moment where Chris Cooper is almost going to shoot her. He's a civilian. Of course, that would be horrible if he did. be murder. I understand why he wants to. And I said the truth, though. People are gray. Not black and white. Right. Uh, so I really like Pharaoh's Army a lot. Film-wise, of all the ones I've spoken about, it's the least good in terms of pure filmmaking. Although it's well done, it's not Fall with the Wind or Lincoln or anything like that. Um, I think it's actually my favorite representation of the war, though. Because it gets on the personal element and because it talks about more dark and bitter things than some of these other movies are willing to discuss. I'll have to check that Definitely. one out. Yeah, please check it out. But keep in mind, everybody, if you were looking for an action-packed war movie, if you're looking for a film where guys are going to bond together in combat, if you're, uh, if you're looking for sweeping epic shots, this is not your movie. This is a character-driven film that's about dialogue and acting above all else. And in those two categories, soars. But yeah, check it out. Check out all of them if you haven't seen them, but... Definitely check out Pharaoh's Army, the little-known film. Oh, Derek, you got any uh, thoughts on movies for the Civil War or anything else? Uh, I'm trying to think. Civil War movies. Um, I guess Gods and Generals would be the next one to ask about. Ooh, that one sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that's bad. See, that's what, hap that's what happened with Gettysburg when the music sucks. The actors aren't really getting into it, and it's based on a bad book. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess to be fair to Jeff Shera, uh, that was the first time he tried to take up his dad's mantle as a writer of historical topics. And uh, Gods in general skips around a lot. The characters don't really get very well established. You don't have a firm idea of what's going on unless you know the history already. And uh, he gets a lot better in his later writings. The Last Full Measures on 1864, it's basically after Gettysburg. That one's much better. And then I think Jeff Scherer's real uh, masterpiece, or you know, closest thing to one at least, was probably Going for Soldiers about the Mexican War. I mean, I haven't read much of his other stuff, but now he does um, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and he looks at more of the soldier perspective rather than the generals. Um, so I guess that's his new niche, but... Gods, Gods and Generals is basically when somebody wrote a novel and they were able to get it published because of their last name, and it should have been a draft that was probably not published. It should have been a writing yeah. exercise for practice. It's not a very good book. Um, it's got moments, though, I'll say that. I like the Hancock stuff probably better than anybody else in it. Yeah, um, Hancock. I think they also follow, it follows Jackson a lot. I think it's Jackson and Hancock are kind of the stars, if I remember. Yeah, it, it doesn't quite get the insanity of Andrew Jackson down. I do want to mention, though, uh, his other books, she said, are more of a common soldier's point of view. 
That's interesting. I think some of that's because like post World War One generals are boring. Yeah. Also, I guess it's hard to really talk about the military genius of anybody in World War One, or even to really point out anything that they did. Period. Other than order an attack or a retreat. You don't have that personal thing with war. I mean, you know, yeah. in the Civil War. I mean, not every general did this, right? But almost every. Well, not every general did this. I mean, okay, like Lee and Grant didn't exactly arrive at the front lines, right? Right. But sometimes they did. Like Grant at Shiloh, Lee at the Wilderness, famously. And so you had to be able to throw yourself into battle sometimes. And of course, other generals did all the time, which is one of the reasons why I love musket combat. Because you know, the aristocrats, the generals who are fighting it, are in, also in danger of dying. You know? Right. And right. ancient warfare, I mean, Alexander, Julius Caesar, they dive on in. You got to believe Tumusian had to have on the. Uh, Mongolian steppes, right? Absolutely. Generals today, generals today just aren't heroic. They, you know, they, if anything, them going to the front lines that far up is like a waste. Yeah, I remember I John, John Keegan said that Wellington was the first truly, or was it Wellington or Grant was the first truly modern commander, the anti-hero. Yeah, that book's bullshit. No, I mean, well, John Keegan was full of shit in general, but... Uh, well, I, I, I'll say this. Face of Battle is well written. Give him credit on that. But yeah, you know me. I really don't like John Keegan. I, my favorite John Keeganism of all time, I read his book on the Iraq War. And he was ta- this is before the um, insurgency got out of hand because he wrote it right as soon as the invasion was complete. And uh, so it was published maybe a month before things went to total hell. It was talking about how it was a brilliant success. It's a model for future action. And it also shows, my favorite line from John Keegan ever, that Britain is the world's premier secondary power. <laughs> and he, oh, he meant this as like the highest form of praise. Like, guys, this is our future. We need to be the best of the second rate powers. Um, and you don't know, you know, you know think John Keegan is, man? He, he, the guy who wrote this one book that's considered a classic, The Face of Battle, and he just dined out on that book for the rest of his fucking career. This, his, his overall history of the Civil War, terrible. Also, uh, yeah, I feel like he's the Thomas Friedman of military history, if that makes sense. Because Thomas Friedman had the one idea in 1982, the world is flat, economically speaking. And then every piece he's ever done since has been that same basic idea, but with some little tiny twist. Yeah, I do. Who's the other one? It's like uh, David Brooks over at the New York Times. Sometimes I'll read their stuff and I feel bad for them because they're like they're they're talking about this neoliberal moderate world that's dead. You know? Yeah. Also one person who I think deserves a lot of credit for moving away from the idea that made him famous is Francis Fukuyama. Uh he was known for um what's the last end was, of history. Yeah, the end of history and the last man. Which is basically saying that liberal democracy's won out, political history's over, and you know neoliberal centrism is the way forward for everybody. The end. Um, I think he's really rethought that in the last ten years. I've got a couple of his books on the formation of the state. Um, one book goes from antiquity to maybe the Middle Ages. The other one goes to the present. And uh, it's very clear that he's rethought all of that stuff from the '90s. But no one talks about the fact that he basically has changed his mind. I also think people simplified his argument from the uh, end of history and the last man. It wasn't necessarily positive. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I mean, I, I feel like I, I hear it on the left a lot, even on um, more of the learned shows like uh, Michael Brooks' show. They'll basically mention Fukuyama as just, oh yeah, that guy's some neoliberal dude from Harvard or wherever. Uh, that is not the impression that I've gotten from his recent works at all. No, same. No, Fukuyama has been missed. Not only was his argument a bit misunderstood at the time, he's been mistreated uh, definitely since then. should be noted, too, all he were really, in a lot of ways, was doing was echoing what with, uh, with Bell wrote with the end of ideology in the 70s. Yeah. He was kind of just building on top of that argument. You know, um, Yeah, you know, end of anything like that, like end of history, end of ideology, it's, 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 it's like unsinkable Titanic. It's... It's a shortcut to you're going to look like an asshole real soon. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like the idea. That, well, you know, the political, our whole history has been a history of political struggle. But now everything will be different. We'll never have any more struggles over ideology ever again. Because yeah. one ideological struggle just ended. Therefore, they're all over. 
I think that there's a, there's that one part. I mean, The Matrix. It's a really good movie, the first one. And there's that one thing Agent Smith said that's always stuck with me when he tells um, a Lawrence Fishburne. What was his character in the movie? Do you remember? Uh, Morpheus. Yeah, Morpheus. Morpheus. There we go. That was Morpheus. You know, we gave humans a paradise. They just couldn't handle it. <laughs> want strife. Want fighting. And I'm like, yeah, it's true. You know, it'll never be utopia. It'll never be paradise. The things will never be settled. We just want to fight all the time. We're doomed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I um, that's, that's part of the reason why in the Star Trek universe... DS9 is my favorite hands down because it shows a much more realistic, gritty world with a little bit of gray. Whereas the other Star Treks, people don't really have meaningful problems. Yeah, well, especially in Next Generation. That was the whole point was uh, Gene Roddenberry was like, it's about a crew that gets together to solve problems. So all the strife's exterior, which is why I'm not a big Next Generation fan. I mean, they're definitely good episodes, but I kind of found it boring, and I liked Worf, even though Worf is poorly used, because all Worf was there to do is get beat up to sh- set up what's a threat, you know? Yeah. I liked that Worf would be the one to, like, not agree. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, the thing is, Worf is so much better in DS9. The problem is that because they ironed out a lot of his problems in uh, TNG, if you really think about his character too deeply, he kind of regressed in some ways, so that way he could go through that stuff again but in a better episode. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, TNG, I, I liked the stories themselves a lot of times, but the characters, I never really got that into. Um, because most of them, again, they, what were the real problems? Like, uh, was it Jordy was shy around women? That was his major struggle. So he has the struggle of like a college freshman. Yeah. Uh, I, I really- it's not that, in, it, it's not that big of a struggle. It's not like, uh, I mean, at least when they introduced the character of Ro Lair, and at least she was a survivor of fucking genocide. So she had some about, uh, things to deal with. Kirk, Spock, and McCoy? Yeah, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, uh, I mean, they didn't have that many real problems compared to people in, like, Deep Space Nine, but... Uh, I mean, they would have disagreements. Yeah, they know, had like... disagreements, and, uh, you know, there was a little bit of racial tension between McCoy and Spock sometimes. Yeah, um... It was also understandable because he was all like, you're too goddamn logical, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and it, Spock would be like, Doctor, you're being very emotional. Uh, but what it also meant was that McCoy would understand things that Spock didn't get. Yes, um, yeah. even though Spock, Spock was would... clearly uh, smarter. Smarter. Or, yeah. So and that of was course, interesting. Spock, Spock and Kirk, they got along, but they weren't like the same person. So they, I don't know, it was... yeah. It, and yeah, I'm not a giant Star Trek fan by any means, but I think the uh, Kirk Spock McCoy relationship was probably the most interesting one that I've still seen. No, especially just from the perspective of uh, you know different personalities working as a symphony, even though they're all playing different instruments. Um, I think that they are a great character trio. I think now they tend to get overlooked because they were all white dudes, but um, they did have differences of personality. And that's definitely a kind of conflict that people do encounter in real life and that they can learn from by watching the original series. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess they've been overlooked if you're obsessed with uh, the white dude aspect. Uh, in, my, in my experience, they're still the three most recognized Star Trek. It, I mean, I know, I'm, I'm sorry, like, you know, like, I can say like Picard, and then people might be like, oh yeah, Picard and Crusher? Which, don't get me wrong, I like Crusher, but, you know, they didn't do much with it. You know? Yeah, um, Dr. Crusher was a little boring most episodes, except when she's arguing with Picard, um, yeah. which is not very often. Um, Counselor Troy, I know a lot of people hated her character. Um, I have a friend who grew up watching Star Trek TNG, and his parents would always call her the human censor, because all she would do is sit on the bridge, Captain, I'm sensing dishonesty. But it would always be super obvious that the person was being dishonest on the other bridge because, you know, the acting was very direct. Yeah, I, I, I didn't like her. I thought she was fucking boring. But, yeah, at least she wasn't Wesley. No, Wesley <laughs> sucked. Wesley was the off. Wesley was just pure shit. Um, yeah. Say what one ever will about anything with the, with the original series. Uh, I don't think any of the seven core characters were annoying. You know, I liked all seven of them. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, TNG, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I, I like Jordy. You know, Worf's fun because he's different. And 
know, but like fucking fucking Wesley Crusher, Jesus fuck. I, I thank God he wasn't there long, you know. But he, he should have never been there. He, <laughs> yeah, he is bad. <laughs> now he he sucked. Um, I guess Tasha Yar didn't have much of a chance. I didn't think she was very good in the time that she had, though. I think she made the right decision to leave the show because her character wasn't going anywhere. Um, yeah, her character wasn't going anywhere, even though I liked her. I did find I know Data's like a fan favorite. I just found him creepy. I found him a little creepy too. I, I felt like he was an attempt to double down on the concept of Spock. Um, yeah, I could see that. I think he had some good moments, like the, especially the episodes where they were able to debate um, whether he counted as a living being or a conscience person or whatever it was. Uh, that was an interesting philosophical episode, but for the most part, um, I. I think that they downplayed Data's abilities because, especially during the battle simulations, the fact that he's has the equivalent of the ship's computer in his own head should have made him damn near unbeatable in all those scenarios. You're that uh, yeah. deeply flawed where he couldn't respond to certain things because they don't rely strictly on logic. Because I know that, like Riker's whole thing it was supposed to be that he's a, a very unorthodox tactician. Well, yeah, Riker's like you know like a diet Kirk. Yeah, <laughs> actually, because um, I know it. Not a you know. Here's my hot take. I actually think Riker was the best character on TNG. Oh God, I thought Riker was so boring. <laughs> he, he's the only person who seems remotely like a real person. I can see what you mean there. I can see what you mean. Um, and also, uh, uh, you know, he actually has fun because uh, a lot of the other characters are very self conscious. Uh, like you know, Jordy's always afraid of his own shadow. Um, Data's. Data, uh, Wesley is Wesley. The doctor doesn't want to have fun in front of her son, and she also has feelings for Kirk but can't admit it. Picard has a cob of his ass most episodes. Yeah, I don't like Picard, man. No, I mean Riker. The- uh, Riker's the only guy who has fun. He has poker parties. He gets laid. I mean, that is uh, if you had to be anybody in TNG, it's obviously Riker. Yeah, I think you got that nailed, man. And that's one thing with some of the original series too, um, with the exception of Spock. I'm like, every character in that one looks like they'll have a drink with you. Yeah. You know, like, fucking like, oh, God, one of my favorite, one of my, like the TNG episode where Scotty shows up and he's with uh, Jordy LaForge. And, you know, Jordy gives Picard an accurate reading. I'm like, it'll take like this many hours to fix. And, you know, Scotty's like, what the hell are you doing? You're supposed to say 10 hours and then it takes five. That way they think you're really impressive. And I'm like, yes, that's the way it's done. <laughs> no, and also, yeah, Scotty was a, uh the best engineer. I think they, they did a good job of uh, creating O'Brien to be the new Scotty because O'Brien <laughs> uh, has a lot of Scotty characteristics, but doesn't seem too forced and he's got enough differences that it works. So I think it's a more, it's a, a better reproduction than data was for Spock. I got to check out more uh, DS9. I've seen some of it. Captain Cisco's great, you know, Quark. Yeah. Uh, but it, I got it, it does take a couple seasons to really get in stride, but, uh, I will say it's also the first one where every single episode always counts for the rest of the series. So any developments that happen in any episode can and will be referenced later and have an impact. So there are no one-offs in TNG and uh, D, excuse me, DS9. Well, um, I want to conclude our thing by uh, talking about a few of those memoirs because sure. I promised to mention them before and I forgotten because when we had our last talk i was a uh, distracted with personal matters um so i do want to mention a bit about the civil war memoirs if you're cool with that and i'm just going to go do a quick one over on a few of them sounds good um, okay so i want to talk about ones that are good from the officer's point of view i'm not talking about soldiers necessarily most of your soldiers things aren't even memoirs Typically, they're like diaries or letters we do have some memoirs like company h by uh, sam watkins and you have, of course, soldier reminisces that would show up, say, in a magazine like Veteran Veteran, National Tribune. That was the newspaper for the Union veterans. But I'm talking specifically about generals in the Civil War and the memoirs they left. Most of your memoirs are written years later. They're written by proud men who are defending their reputations. So they are to always be taken carefully. Carefully. Right? And one of my big complaints with Grant's memoirs is too many historians treat Grant's memoirs like fact. I'm like, no, Grant's memoirs 
written by a dying man. Wrote him kind of on the rush. He wrote them to support his family. Also a vindictive man, too. Grant's memoirs, I'm not saying, are useless. They have uses, and they are pretty good memoirs, but they must, as historical documents, be treated carefully, and I would also argue they're not even the best Civil War memoirs. I might put them in the top ten, not my top five. Uh, and I do w- want to mention... Didn't uh, Samuel it? Clemens help him compose his memoirs? Yes, yes, he did. That's what I've, uh, that's what I've heard thereabouts. Um, and Grant's memoirs do have good passages in mind, and once again, they're not bad memoirs. They're in the top ten, but I think people elevated Grant's memoirs a little too much. I want to mention a sixth favorite. Mention three Union, three Confederate, and I'll save my favorite for last. Okay. So we'll go through the Union ones first. My favorite's a Confederate one. But Union-wise, William Tecumseh Sherman's memoirs are excellent. Now, they're a bit long in the tooth. They are, um, they are not short, that's for damn sure. But Sherman can paint a scene probably better than any other general I can think of. His letters are great to read as well. He's just a fantastic writer. This man had not been a general. He might have made a good novelist, at least a very striking one. His description of leaving Atlanta to go on the march to the sea is superb. Now, that said, as a historical document, read very carefully, um... Anything, uh, Sher- some of Sherman's inaccuracies are more ludicrous than Grant's, such as, said I was never surprised at Shiloh. That's a load. <laughs> but they are superbly written. They're great for anecdotes. I do like Sherman's memoirs a lot. There's also David Stanley. Now, David Stanley was a uh, man did um, infantry at the Battle of Corinth, October 1862, uh, kind of cavalry in the 1863 in Tennessee. And then a corps in 1864 being wounded at Frank Battle of Franklin, where he won the Medal of Honor. Uh, David Stanley's memoirs are some of my very, very favorites because he's so blunt and bitter. I mean, he was known for being a very caustic man. He feared no man either, you know, completely fearless in battle. His memoirs are just a hoot. I mean, you're just reading him. He's giving you his blunt opinion about people. I think he all but says that he's like some some passages like this guy deserved to die uh, this guy's a total asshole I'll never believe anything he says i mean it's just great stuff so sim memoirs like kind of like play nice with things like john pope and richard johnson uh, david stanley you always know where he stands so yeah i like david stanley's memoirs quite a bit another good union one is abner doubleday abner doubleday is a dyed in the wool abolitionist so when he writes about the war starting, he doesn't write about it like, oh my God, what a tragedy. He says he was glad to fire the first shot of the war. Well, I'm sorry, make pause. The first Union shot of the war. Doubleday is the man who fired the first return shot at Fort Sumter. And became a general, he fought at like Antietam and Gettysburg. Doubleday is also rather blunt. Definitely get the abolitionist point of view in the war. He's a pretty good writer as well, so it does flow very well. That said, Doubleday's opinions of what officers were doing are very colored. He hated Hooker and Meade, so anything he says about those two should be taken very carefully. Um, Now getting to the Confederates. There is Richard Taylor, a very successful general. He wrote something called, it's called Destruction and Reconstruction. Uh, Taylor is like Stanley as well, very blunt man. But in some ways more erudite, like Richard Taylor will make obscure historical and even classical references. He's a highly educated and intelligent. Um, his writing is very good. His particular passage about armchair historians who can wipe out whole armies with their ink. <laughs> and I quote that in some of my books sometimes because, you know, you should avoid that kind of stuff. I do recommend Taylor to get not just a, uh, a well-written memoir, but a point of view from somebody who's definitely pro-Confederate and it can be articulate, eloquent. Because Jeff Davis wrote his memoirs, essentially, Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government. It's turgid, right? Taylor is not turgid. Another good one is Edward Porter Alexander. Edward Porter Alexander was also pretty honest in his memoirs. You could even criticize Robert E. Lee. By the way, he was an artillery commander in 
the Army of Northern Virginia. He's depicted in the movie Gettysburg. <clears throat> He's the guy in charge of the bombardment. They actually played him. Did a real good job. Anyway, Alexander's memoirs are they're a good read. You get some honest and some unusual opinions too. Um, like one of them in there is about the Battle of Petersburg, the 15th to 18th war, and he actually says that Lee's decision not to counterattack on June 18th, 1864, doomed that it was over to win. Huh. His take yeah. on McClellan is interesting because you know people say like, "Oh, McClellan was a peace candidate." And Alexander says, "And I found out McClellan repudiated the peace platform and said the war would go on." He said, "I knew we were lost." And from then on, I no longer had heart for the cause. Just interesting, unusual passages that go against our received wisdom. He wasn't a big lost cause guy. I mean, he obviously won the Confederacy to win, but you're not going to get some of the lost cause uh, stuff you would get with Taylor. Alexander definitely wrote very good memoirs, and that would be called Fighting for the Confederacy. Oh. Uh, not his published memoirs. He published his own memoirs in his lifetime, which were more restrained. The more raw ones were published in the 1980s. But my fair one is by St. John Richardson Lydell. Louisiana slave owner, Confederate general, ended a brigade at Perryville, Stones River, and Liberty Gap, led a division at Chickamauga, cavalry in the Red River Campaign, and commanded Confederate troops in the last true battle of the Civil War. That's Fort Blakely outside of Mobile. Uh, Lydell's memoir is known as Lydell's Record. It was never published. It was just a series of notes that he wrote. He died in 1870, shortly after the war. He was murdered during a feud that he had with a fellow Confederate officer named Jones. Uh, the feud actually dated from before the war. So anyway, uh, Lydell's record is good because it is, even though it's a reconstruction done by a gentleman named Hughes, it is raw, blunt, and very emotional. He actually talks about his dreams at one point. Huh. I mean about how he can see the Confederacy father telling us. Um, that rawness that you get, <coughs> it's something that makes this my favorite memoir to read. Like, for instance, page two of his memoir, he tells you about how he, hate, how he hates democratic government. I guess it makes sense. He's a slave-owning aristocrat. Sort of, but it actually starts off differently. He starts off talking to Braxton Bragg, who's also a slave-owning aristocrat. Braxton Bragg was talking about democracy, and Lydell says, I disagreed with my friend Bragg. He said, essentially, he, he, he tells you so many words that nobody but a property owner should ever vote. <laughs> so he wants to go back to uh, the original Constitution, then. Yeah, in some ways. Actually, he says what he prefers is a British limited monarchy. Wow. Um, actually, I can... Uh, you're right. So he's like an the Alexander book. Hamilton uh, supporter. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm actually writing a piece in a essay collection. They wanted to do an, they're doing an essay collection about, um, you know, uh, Civil War um, primary sources. And I said, I'll do Lydell's record because it's my favorite. And here, I just pull it up because I got it next to me. Um, oh, this is what Lydell says about after he's like talking to Bragg. He says, I could have no confidence in the stability of things or affairs when a popular majority whose will, in scare quotes, guided by passion or hatred, execute their higher law construction of the written constitution of the Union. There could be no worse tyranny under the sun. The greater number of tyrants, the more insufferable the tyranny. Ag was a strong Democrat and believed in the integrity of republics. He overlooked the fact, an unsurmountable one with popular governments, that the masters are ever liable to become fanatical or exacting or venal. Sorry, the masses, not masters, my bad. When controlled by corrupt representative leaders, oftentimes cloaked with religion. Hmm. That is an and, interesting little twist at the end. Yeah, it is interesting. That's the thing. You'll read this, you'll be like, that's an interesting twist there, you know? And this is a man who I would disagree with him on so many things, right? Slavery, democracy, um, but there is uh, 
an honesty and an earnestness in this that I just have to respect. Lydell, I mean, you know, remember Hillary Clinton said, I have a public opinion and a private one? Yeah. Which was obvious. We all knew that, you know? We all, I mean, you know, she's a known liar. You can see in her face that she's lying. The only thing she looked excited about was war. That's why I didn't vote for her. Well, that and the possibility of her being president. True, yeah, I'll never vote for a warmonger, you know? Yeah. Um, Ever. Uh, But... With Lydell, there is no personal and public persona. What you see is what. Is that why he never his... got to core command? Yes, that's exactly it. I'm re- you read Lydell's record, and you're like, you're like, you can see. On the one hand, he has a lot of friends and connections. Jeff Davis, Braxton Bragg, and people actually reveal a lot of things to him. There's a him and Bragg actually have a very tender moment for Stones River. Um, where Bragg, sorry. Bragg is talking about how he, uh, he really needs to win this next battle. And he hopes Lydell has his back. And he's saying to Lydell, I know we used to be really good friends and we're not. And Lydell's like, my God, I, I misthought of this man. He actually does care. And he says, that moment I swore that I would do everything in my power to uphold him in this battle. But Bragg then told Lydell... You know, me and my wife have no children. I view my soldiers as my own children. And Lydell said, some of his men heard that and said, he has a funny way of showing his love by having his children shot. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I love soldiers' gallows humor, especially Confederate. I don't know why the Confederate gallows humor is more humorous to me, you know? <laughs> it's probably but, just a little darker because they, I imagine a lot of them suspected they weren't going to win. Yeah, maybe. I, I think so. T- I, I, th- I think that was uh, partially it, you know? Uh, it, it's something I haven't figured out yet. I mean, the North has some good stuff too, but, but the South in particular, you get some good gallows humor from regular Confederates. Big fan of gallows humor. But, um... Lydell's bluntness probably prevented him. And what's good about his record, too, is he will mention some of his failures, especially emotional ones. Like, Lydell, after Chickamauga, he lost his division. He said, send me to Louisiana. Send me back to my home. And he gets there, and he fucking hates it. Hates Richard Taylor. It's interesting, because people praise Taylor a lot. Lydell really hates Richard. Kind of arrogant and insufferable. Anyway... He gets transferred back, and then he runs into one of his former comrades from the Army of Tennessee, and he actually grabbed him and said, why did you abandon us? And almost cries. Wow. Uh, here's, here's another one, too. He talks about why he's in Tullahoma. He said that Bragg's in a fight here, and the other officer said, no, he's not. So they bet each other that when the war was over, the one who lost the bet would get the other one an oyster dinner at New Orleans. And Lydell writes in his record... I still haven't fulfilled my promise from losing that bet, you know? Yeah. So there's just these wonderful personal touches that you partially get because you know, Sherman, Stanley, um, not as much Taylor, Alexander, these guys wrote decades after the war was over. Lydell started writing down these notes as soon as it was... So not only do you get that raw emotional side and bluntness, you also get a view of the Civil War... It is pro-Confederate, but one where the lost cause myth hasn't formed. Oh. That is and it, I mean, you can see elements of the lost cause in there, but it doesn't have some of the sentimentality that you're going to see later on. So, yeah, of all the general memoirs, Lydell's record is my favorite. I'd probably say David Stanley is my second favorite. How much that, of um, Longstreet's memoirs have you read? Um, wait, uh, just a little bit. Um, read some passages involving Beauregard and a few other things. Uh, I thought Longstreet was okay. He, he did tend to be a little too like, uh, this is what I would have done and things would have been better kind of thing, which, you know, you get with a lot of Confederates like Johnston, Beauregard. Beauregard's memoirs, by the way, quick aside on that one. Um, they're technically written by Alfred Roman, who was one of his staff officers. Really a collaboration between Beauregard and Roman. 
as a as a piece of literature, they're not very good. I will say though, they're some of the most accurate memoirs you run in. As Beauregard repeatedly like publishes entire sections of official record. Right. That doesn't make for a great read, but it means that his memoirs, despite whatever flaws they have, both as literature and because they are pro Beauregard, they're still more accurate than the other people. I I have a fairly high opinion of Beauregard's memoirs as a historical resource, but not as a piece of literature. Ones I've named today, I think, are decent historical resources, but should be taken carefully, as they all should. All the ones I've mentioned today work pretty well as a good read. At the bare minimum. Uh, there's always something to be said for that. Yeah, yeah. Even though, you know, in grad school, you're not allowed to make a comment about something being hard to read or a good read. It's not considered scholarly. Yeah, fuck that. That's a bunch of horse shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is a such thing as good and bad writing. It's real. Very real. Very real. Yeah, no, no. It's, um, and probably, they'd probably historians that could be, could do a little better if it was a little less, uh, technical and whatnot, but. I don't particularly want to get into the profession. You got any uh, thoughts on uh, memoirs in general? I mean, um, um, are there any noted ancient memoirs? Ancient memoirs? Um, we know that a lot of them were written. Most have not survived, though. Um, the only one, the closest thing we have to a surviving memoir that I can think of right offhand would be Caesar's commentaries on the Gallic War, and then some of the commentaries he left from the early parts of the Civil War. Um, Sola wrote memoirs, they were lost. But they get cited once in a while by Plutarch or some later writer. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't think any of the Greek uh, Greek figures wrote memoirs. Really, I guess Solon did write poems, which talked about his career. Sometimes a little bit uh, anecdotally. Um, yeah, there aren't really too many memoirs from the ancient world. But Xenophon. Oh yeah, you're right. The Anabasis is basically a big ass memoir, although it's really more of a "Here's my time." Yeah, I guess it literally is a memoir in the uh, Civil War sense. It'd be like if somebody went on a major campaign and wrote, uh, "Here was my experience in the Second Invasion of the North." Yeah, it is interesting that Grant. I, I mention this because like Grant wrote his memoirs, right? He didn't write right. memoirs of his presidency, which I mean, isn't that big? You right? think, although uh, I guess his presidency wasn't a lot of uh, corruption in him being drunk. Um, yeah, the 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 drunk part's a little more complicated. One of my favorite things about Grant, though, is that he likes booze. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, it makes him more human, though, because it's like, hey, look, you can be an alcoholic or have a problem and be successful. Because um, yeah. Grant was more of like uh, the kind of person who, when he started. Grant wouldn't drink every day, but he would drink when he was pressed or when he had nothing to do, or if you gave him a drink, he just didn't know when to stop. I know? I know someone exactly like that, actually. Um, but if you kept him away from it, he could be sober for months on end. You know, I, just to, to make sure the booze... Like, like, there's lots of instances where Grant would not be drinking at all, but someone else would bring, a, bring you some booze, and he'd be like, oh, well, that looks good. <laughs> yeah. I've heard, um, I was reading earlier, actually, uh, in my spare time, I've been reading a book on the Peninsular War from the Napoleonic era, and it said that Wellington was considered a light drinker by the standards of his day. He would only have four or five cups of wine with dinner and then polish off a bottle afterwards, and that was considered to be fairly abstinent at the time. Yes. I mean, in America, Alcohol consumption at that era is through the roof, and that's how you would make all agreements. I mean, all like like if you're doing a business agreement, you get drunk. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, well, it's definitely a light drinker for the time. <laughs> Which is kind of crazy because think about today's standards. Uh, people would say that guy has a problem. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite things about our ancestors is their uh, love of booze. Um, no, there's um. Oh, shit, one of my favorite ones ever. We're talking about Civil War generals getting drunk. Here's one. General Crittenden, uh, who, um, Thomas Crittenden, he's a, his brother George fought for the Confederacy. Thomas fought for the North. He was a corps commander at um, Perryville, Stones River, and Chickamauga. Anyway, after Stones River was over, he got drunk and just started singing Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. 
I just love it. He, he got wasted, so he starts singing Mary Had a Little Lamb. The fuck? <laughs> Did anybody um, sing along, or were people just staring at him? You no, know, the other guys started singing along with him. <laughs> now, Grant famously hated music. He uh, he said the only two tunes he knew was Yankee Doodle and not Yankee Doodle. Wow. <laughs> uh, but no, no, so... um. Yeah, no, Grant, uh, Grant's presidency, it's a very controversial presidency. Like, I mean, most presidents do good and some bad, right? I mean, you know, the right. um, George Washingtons and the George W. Bushes of the world are uh, a little harder to come. But, uh, no, Grant's, and, and keep in mind, Grant wrote his while he was dying as well. But it's interesting, Grant first thought right about the war, you know? Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. He's better known as a general than as president. Yeah. Your average general memoir might have a little bit about what they did before the war. They rarely talk what they did after. Yeah. I will give credit to Richard. Oh, Richard Taylor does do that, though. Richard Taylor talks about what he does during Reconstruction. That makes his memoir unique. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I didn't realize it's good that... Stuff. I didn't realize that too many people were, uh, that many people were reticent about their life after the war. Because I know today, if somebody were writing a memoir, uh, you know, we always have this interest, where are they today? Yeah. Um, I think Mark Twain probably said it best. He said, write, write a memoir in your early 40s. And like that, he said, you know, before you've forgotten everything, while well, you've lived enough to make it interesting. Wow. Well, uh, makes sense. I think it, it, perspective on that one uh but no no i thought about that with ancient sources all i could think of was xenophon and caesar really i know you have like cicero's letters for instance yeah although they weren't intended to be a memoir and it's not even clear if they were intended for publication um because a lot of them he wrote to his friend atticus and a lot of it is just him bitching about um arguments with his wife and then how pompey doesn't appreciate him enough because he had a huge man crush on pompey how i gotta ask you though man like why did his letters survive? That just seems so crazy to me. Uh, that his per he was considered, and even by his political enemy Augustus, who of course had him executed, he was considered to be the purest Latin stylist. So people preserved everything that he wrote as well as they could, so they could study composition. That's the main reason why a lot of his stuff survived and was circulated. Um, and Atticus apparently was dedicated to the memory of his friend and he had kept every single letter that Cicero had sent him. And wow. uh, so a lot of it is accident of survival, but also he's considered the standard for Latin prose and has been pretty much since his own time. So his stuff, there was always a special place for it, even at monasteries, and they would always make sure to copy it. Whereas with a lot of other texts, if they weren't as interested, they wouldn't copy it and it would slowly be lost over time. Damn. So, uh, yeah, that's basically why, is because people thought he was a good read. That's really the main thing that kept him preserved. Because a lot of other okay. people wrote surviving wrote letters that survived for a while, uh, maybe a century or so, but usually they would even be lost before antiquity was done. I want to say Catiline had surviving letters, but now there's only a little tiny fragment that's preserved in Sallust, and we don't know how accurate that is. I was actually thinking of Catiline because you mentioned Cicero, and I was actually thinking, I was like, man, it'd be great to have Catalines. Well, yeah, apparently that existed for a little while, um, just like Sola's memoir. But, uh, yeah, so these, uh, the ancient figures, um, I think it was more of a Roman thing to do the memoir. I don't get the impression that a lot of ancient Greeks did that, at least not until the time of Eridus, who was um, an Achaean League official. I'm pretty sure he wrote a memoir. And then Philippe well, Amin wrote a memoir. Since we're in tangent land, um, is there any great historical works written by Persians about Persia? No. Um, we So I don't know if there were ever any written at, any, at some point, but uh, almost all of the Achaemenid era literature we have is on those inscriptions you see at Persepolis and other places. Um, that's why if you actually study Achaemenid Persian, you can learn it in about six weeks because there's really not that much to know based on our current state of understanding and the amount of available material. And that's sad. Oh, it is. I know. Um, 
And that's why I was deeply disheartened when we were having the tension with Iran and Trump was talking about possibly bombing co Persian cultural sites. Um, because there's so little that we have now. If we were to lose more, we'd basically have nothing. Yeah, that's why, like, when you hear the thing about, the, like, uh, ISIS, like, destroying Persian architecture. Yeah, I'll be honest, like, um, I didn't give a shit about ISIS until they started doing that. Yeah, like... I mean, it's our bias being historians, but that's really made my blood boil because I was like, no, this is, this is, I mean, so little is left. This is a cultural legacy, ancient Near East, and you're just obliterating it. And, you know, you're, I mean, partially you're doing it because, you know, this is infidel stuff. And it's like, uh, but that's, that's why I like the um, passage in uh, Winds of Winter, which hasn't come out yet. But George R. R. Martin's working hard because he's got nothing else to do during quarantine. Where, you know, he's talking about like, uh, you know, like he's like, go to any world, you'll find different gods. <laughs> I, I mean, I'd look at a Muslim and I'd be like, uh, so your god only came around the year 800. What are the previous gods, huh? But yeah. Zeus was lying. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, uh... like what the Jews, the Jews had it wrong is what you're telling me, right? <laughs> well, they <laughs> did. Just... They did. They did think that the Jews and Christians had some of it right. So they gave them some credit. Fuck um, all that. The only true religion is uh greek <laughs> yeah it was it was definitely zeus and the olympians yeah everything everything you see right now is just zeus and the olympians just fucking with us okay <laughs> yeah and right now they're they're planning their comeback it's been a long time coming they were just really hurt that they were abandoned for the christian god and their their feelings have taken time to heal but they're about to make a big comeback and on july 7th of this year the greek gods are coming back I wasn't well, supposed to reveal that, but now that y'all know. <laughs> well, who told you, huh? Athena? I mean, I, I won't say uh, it was Athena, yes. She came to me in a dream. Uh, so, you know, just keep that on the DL, everybody. Got it, man. Wait, you, you went to Nashville. Did you go to the uh, the Athena statue they had there? Yes, I did. That was cool, man. <laughs> yeah, it's was pretty cool. neat. Uh, I liked it. I, I thought it was a pretty cool thing. I think they chose the right part of their centennial celebration to save. Because I saw the other buildings, at least the pictures of them. I don't think most of the other ones would have become very iconic. Probably not. I do have, I mean, I know we're in a side land. I do have one last question for you about the, the, about the Persian thing. We, we don't have a lot of Persian sources. When I mean, we have what the Greeks say about the Persians, and we have the inscriptions. Do we not have a lot because uh, the Persians weren't very big on that type of writing? Or is it because of the destruction of like the library of Alexandria and the library of Baghdad by the Mongols. Um, good question. I don't know for certain. Um, I know that sometimes a lot of the genres we think of as given were actually very Greek in their conception. Uh, history is a genre for instance. So there were chronicles written before that and other civilizations, but the idea of history as Herodotus or Thucydides envisions it is very Greek. Also, um, That's my thought. Yeah, so, um, for instance, the Romans don't have a written history until about the time of the Second Punic War. That's the first time somebody sat down and wrote a history, at least a Roman. And that was a cousin of Fabius the Delayer named Fabius Pictor. And he wrote in Greek okay. because there was no Latin tradition of doing this. So um, it's very possible that there never was a grand Persian narrative written down. And maybe it was passed around by aristocrats orally, but it certainly wasn't written down. Or if there ever was one, then it was lost a long time ago. And it may have been a secret text, kind of like the secret history of the Mongols or something of that nature. Okay. Or possibly, like I said, destroyed in the libraries. But I was thinking, I was, that's what I was wondering, because I always thought that, you know, at least our first written histories you have is a Greek invention as far as we can tell. I mean, you know, some fucker in Egypt could have invented it and then got stoned to death or shit got burned, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, Egypt did have histories, but a lot of them were more chronicles or local histories in the sense it would be the history of this temple or um, a history of the people who have visited this town. It wouldn't be these kind of grand storytelling exercises. They did have novels right. in Egypt, though. So they did invent the novel by about the middle to late kingdom. Or okay. Kingdom. Yeah. So last uh, aside question before we close things up. Um, so uh, the, you know, in Mesopotamia, they had an idea of literature, at least with the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? 
Yes. So why did that one survive? And I mean, to my knowledge, do we have anything else literary from that period, or is it just Epic of Gilgamesh? There are others. Um, I can't. I think Enuma Elish is another one from that period that's yeah. pretty related. But the reason why we have the ones we have is because they were copied by school children a lot. So we have a shit ton of surviving evidence. Um, so a lot of the ways people learn how to read and write would be to copy down Gilgamesh. Mm. So we have school children copies and some little fragments that were probably written by kids. Good and, exercise, uh, kids. Good exercise. Yeah. Oh, and uh, same, right. thing, same thing with some a few pieces of Cicero, actually, but... Uh, more with the little tablets from Mesopotamia. I forgot. You mentioned Civil War books. Yes, n novels specifically. Novels. Um, here, um, there, there's there's not a ton that I've read, actually. Um, I don't know of... Um, I guess I, I've read a few, though. But it. I would say this. Um, I'm thinking about Civil War novels, at least the ones that I've read. I can... I can mention four. There's a graphic novel called Battle Lines, which I was a big fan of a few years back. Very well-drawn panels. Truly gives you a diverse perspective of the war. Like you get slaves. You get the better woman on the home front. Soldiers north and south. Different experiences of the war. I thought it was very good. Very well done. So I definitely recommend the graphic novel. Might be the right way to say More like a short story collection of Battle Lines. And then, of course, is The Killer Angels, which is Gettysburg is based on. It is very well written. Um, probably my favorite chapter of that is when Lee conceives of Pickett's Charge because he actually constructs his logic for it, you know? which is conjectural. Lee never told anybody why, how he conceived of it, but you can actually see Lee thinking this idiotic attack is going to work. Right. Because he builds a line of logic. And yeah, Killer Angels, very good, definitely worth reading. Uh, but um, one of my favorites are um, alternate history involving time travel. Are you talking about uh, <laughs> Guns of the South? Guns of the South is good, and so is Bring the Jubilee. What's Bring the Jubilee? Uh, Bring the Jubilee is about a guy who lives in a timeline where... Okay, I'm going to be straight first off. Uh, spoilers ahead for a book from the 1950s. But I'll go ahead and tell you the plot, okay? Okay. So Bring the Jubilee is about a guy who lives in the North when the North lost the war. Things are reversed. The South is technology advanced and empire. The South has ended slavery. The North, meanwhile, is backwards economically, and the North is really racist, too, because Northerners blame slavery for causing the destruction of America and their defense. And the North is, like, super racist. They blame black. And... This character, you get into, like, I mean, there's all sorts of asides. Like, there's a few chapters about his affair with a wealthy woman. There's his friendship with a Haitian diplomat. But what eventually happens is he gets in with these scientists who have figured out time travel. He goes back in time and accidentally makes the Confederacy lose. Which means he's stuck in their time. He never get back to the one he came from. So huh. the story is written as in, like, our timeline was created by this guy making this accident and doing so caused himself great personal harm because right before he, the last thing he saw before he left was the woman he loves. You know, there's a lot of stuff in there about sex and love stories. So he feels that he obliterated the timeline, wiped out everybody he knew. Like going back in time and doing what he Bring the Jubilee is not like superbly written. By the way, I thought the prose was a little rough, but I liked it overall, and it has a very powerful ending. Guns yeah. of the South. You read Guns of the South, right? I have, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's fun, I guess. It's, uh, it's... it's fun, man. It's good, you know. It's it's you know I, one of the good things. I mean, like I mean, I got my quibbles with things. Like Grant's way too gracious story. Lee is probably way too, way more open-minded than he would be. Some of the characters do some weird stuff. But overall, Earl Dove showed that he had a very good grasp of the history of the war and the details of it. So I thought it was very good. And 
it does kind of defy because there's, there's a there's sort of a popular idea with a lot of historians that only the Civil War could have ended slavery. Not for that, slavery would have continued on until today. You can see it in that movie, um, uh, CSA. Oh yeah, it's a documentary, right? And I'm yeah. like, this is fucking, this is fucking ridiculous. Slavery was gonna die. Yeah, and then instead of having the communist scare, they had the Abbey scare. Yeah, yeah, the Abbey scare. But he's trying to make comments about American history, of course. Um, I think slavery would have died because of international pressure, which is Guns of the South talks about. And um, international pressure and um, what's the other one? Oh, yeah. Economics. So economically, brief, okay, briefly, slavery was on the decline of the decline of the South before two things happened. Cotton gin and granulation of sugar. Those two things make sure make slavery profitable. In the 1870s, the price of cotton collapsed. So that means that the slave system would not have been as profitable. Now, that does not mean the end of slavery would have been necessarily good for black people that much. They were dealing with a deeply racist society. This idea that we need a civil war to end slavery is just a way for us to justify slaughtering. Just a way to make yourself feel better. It's a lullaby. Right. And um, I like that Guns of the South deals with the idea of the Confederacy slowly freeing its slaves. Lee saying, hey, you know, if we don't do this, we're going to be a pariah to the rest of the world. And international pressure was enough to force other places to abandon slavery. So I like that part, even if Robert E. Lee is probably way too broad-minded narrative. I mean... Yeah, I guess, um, and that, that story is sort of explained by how he's sort of shocked at the vehemency of the racism of the time travelers. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I actually do agree with that because the time travelers come from something called the AWB, which were like far right, actually neo Nazi types of South Africa. And I do emphatically say Confederates are not Nazis. When people like, well, sometimes conflate the two, I'm like, that's moronic. Uh, if anything, Adolf Hitler was more inspired by the North than the South. Because the North are the ones who conquered the Plains tribe to set up reservations, which he thought was pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, I so... remember also uh, that one person who told us that um, Napoleon is evil because he inspired Hitler. So Yeah, I don't care about that. Just... <laughs> so people, it's the internet. Everybody has a voice. So you get yeah. good stuff, you get bad stuff. Uh, also, uh, yeah, who did Napoleon not inspire? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no just like um in i mentioned that because it's sort of a napoleonic thing as well like you're like oh well hitler's evil if i don't like napoleon napoleon must be pro-hitler like no he's not same thing with the confederacy the confederates are racist fighting for a bad cause they live in a world though where everybody is a racist the idea that white people are superior to these people is not only natural, but self-evident. Otherwise, if white people are not superior, how come they've conquered the world? That's what they would say. Africa, Asia, everywhere is conquered by white people within those decades, centuries. Of course they think they're superior. They have nothing but evidence around them, evidence as far as they can see. Yes, yeah, that's also why uh, the Greeks, including Aristotle, they just started with the premise that Greeks must be superior, and then they look for the reasons why. Yeah. And there was never I mean, a question of, well, should we think about this premise more? Or if they did think about it, then they say, well, but I look at the world around us. Clearly, the Greeks have conquered, and uh, we invent everything that gets invented. We've written all the cool stuff. So, yeah, we're clearly the, the best. Let's just figure out why that's the case. If anything, I don't view the Confederates as some, like, forerunner to Nazis. like Because, for one thing, Confederates don't have an extermination agenda. Uh, but they do have an agenda of slavery, which I think they're more close to, like, the Roman Republic. You know, your average Confederate wants to create a slave-holding republic controlled by elite. These guys are well-versed in Roman history. That's what they even say. They would say to Northerners, of course we're fine with slavery. Or the Romans. They're the greatest ever, aren't they? The Greeks, too. 
you know, they would say slavery's always with us. The ancients did. You know? um, so I, and you know, like I view Napoleon as more of a trying to combine the French Revolution with enlightened despotism, as you know, Frederick the Great was one of his big heroes, uh, probably his biggest hero, honestly. And by the same token, the Confederacy is really almost trying to create like something like a Roman Republic in their period. Um, you know, Nazis come out of um, something a bit. It should be noted that uh, nothing I've ever read shows Nazis drawing anything at all. From... One of my big points about that, one of the biggest differences between Nazis and Confederates is that Confederates typically believe in universal male suffering. Nazis believe in no suffering. Yeah. That, that's like, a no, pretty big difference. It is, it is. It, and, you know, it's one of the things that, uh, I mean, Hitler hates democracy. He's a mockery. And um, that's one of the reasons why he doesn't draw a lot of influence from Confederacy or America, really, in general. I mean, he he, he was interested in American westward expansion. He thought that was cool. He wanted to do it with Russia, of course. Made Russia, killed all the Slavs, set up farms out there, whatnot. But beyond that, he really didn't look at America as anything inspiring. Him. <coughs> I guess it would make sense. Uh, I mean, I doubt that too many Germans were all that interested in America in terms of using it as an example because you know, they had their own history and traditions in Europe. They didn't need to borrow from an adolescent America. Except movies. They liked American movies, of course. Uh, Gone with the Wind was popular there. A variety of movies. Hitler loved American romantic comedies, for instance. Uh, hell, Hitler's favorite movie was King Kong. Really? Uh, yeah. One thing about that, too. Um, I was reading this account by a German soldier at Normandy, and they used to joke that Americans were cowboys. That's what they called them. So they, their joke amongst each other was that when they would land at D-Day, when the when the when the thing came down for the landing craft, like that little gate thing would come down, they imagined they would come out and horseback with pistols, <laughs> shooting at them. <laughs> oh man! Though fun aside about Gone with the Wind, uh, we're in account of Japanese officers when they captured Singapore. They found a copy of Gone with the Wind, Gone with the Wind there. And they they played it. The guy wrote down, at that point, I knew we were going to lose the Pacific War. As he said, the technical expertise of Gone with the Wind was beyond anything Japan could do in a movie. At that moment, I knew that they would excel technology to such a degree that we could never compete with them. Their industrial technological base was beyond. Yeah, I guess that, that proved to be the case. Uh also, Gone with the Wind, big hit in Japan post-World War II. Yeah, I guess so that makes sense. Maybe it's, a, it's about people losing a war and they're an honor-based society. Be whiz, you know, be able to draw connections with other cultures. You know. Yeah. Right. Are you sure it's not that the Japanese were just being cultural appropriators, Sean? I, mean, I guess they kind of are, man. I mean, you know, like a lot of anime is like aggressively Western in its look and everything. Yeah, no, like uh, that's why I find that uh, cultural appropriation argument to be so poor sometimes because it basically just takes the idea of sharing and learning from one another and pisses on it. So it basically undermines the entire point of all learning. Yeah, it also, you know, I, I agree with that too. And I think uh, another big one is that one of the ways that cultures will sometimes learn to hate each other less is through artistic exchange and imitation. You know? And once that's cut off, um, some of that sharing, learning, and building is lost. Right? So there's a good book called Singing the Master, which is um, in the 90s, and it's about the music slaves made how how that music was created, how that music was, what the influences on that music were, also about the influences that Western music had in them. So, for instance, slaves don't have violins, right? But slaves like the violin. Our slaves became masters of playing the violin. It's one of the ways they would make money on the side, even gain some notoriety. And so he's talking about an exchange between the two things, as well as the fact that 
white people then took slave music and made the minstrel show. This chapter in the minstrel show is great because he goes into all the complications of the minstrel show. At the one time, it is a form of cultural appropriation. And it's also, he points out that the people who used to perform minstrel shows were usually those who supported expanded black rights, like Al Jolson, for instance, who did blackface, right? Minstrel right. shows. Right. Al Jolson was like aggressively against segregation for from what I've read. So um, talking about this very complicated thing, and I feel we got simplified to it's cultural appropriation. And the other problem with that too is it builds resentment. I mean, am I to say a black person you shouldn't play Mozart or something? Yeah, I yeah. guess. Uh, by, by logical extension, that would be the conclusion. Or if, uh, yeah, I guess white people shouldn't do jazz or even rock since it's derived in part from jazz. Yeah, it's, it's fucking dumb. I mean, I got a, I have a Ray Charles record, which is all country music. Ray Charles love country. Yeah, I mean, you know, something it's, fucking wrong. Yeah, it, the cultural appropriation argument. That's an example of an argument which, if you examine it, and it, especially its consequences for more than a second, it should be obvious why it's flawed. Yeah, they do have some points though, to a degree, right? I think like, what they're really observing is that there are people who take up ideas and aesthetics that don't match them. And it comes across as awkward and creepy. And there are especially mostly white people who really try to inhabit that space to a point where it becomes obnoxious. Yeah. That's like, uh, I, I, I do agree. Like vanilla ice would be an example of that. Yeah. Um, Cause I think what they're really complaining about is that there are some socially inept white dudes who go too far with stuff which you know that okay but that doesn't necessarily mean that in general you can't learn from appreciate and sometimes participate in cultural forms that you're not born into you know the kind of like thing is is that it's um also goes into um this thing where you have um sorry i'm losing my words okay yeah, there it is um this thing where Certain kinds of like white people and liberals really dislike their own culture and think it's vapid and boring, you know? They gotta find something else, right? Yeah. And that's not not that doesn't just involve like black people, for instance. Um, you know, in in, in the twenties, such thirties, twenties, thirties, and forties, for your average white liberal, what they're really into is poor white people. That's why you get books like uh, "Let Us Now Speak of Famous Men." Or, right? That's when they got into folk music and started recording folk music. You know? Right. Go into those like mountains and backwoods, find some poor white people and have them sing Barbara Allen to a different version of it. And as an eternal quest of the um, of the cultural left is a hatred of itself. George Wall writes about it in The Road to Wigan Pier. He writes section the road to Wigan Pier about how there's an economic left and a cultural left. And he's writing this, by the way, 1930s. Like fucking, I think the book was written like, I mean, we're talking like pre-Munich agreement, okay? And he says, in that book, he says there's a economic left, which is mostly working class people who they just want better wages and a better working condition. They don't give a shit about much of anything else. He says, there's a cultural left, which is typically educated, which actually just hates itself. And wants to recreate the culture and he actually says in the book these two groups do not like each other they have different objectives and they will break in the future he said right now they're only united temporarily he predicted the breakdown that happened in the 1960s he predicted it 30 years before it happened and i'm pretty yeah. sure some of you yeah. predicted it too but when i was reading those passages it read like something from today that's why george orwell is a fucking genius and the greatest writer ever Anyway, that's just my, you know, opinion. Sure. <laughs> no, anyway. that's, uh, that's an interesting point, though. I think that there is a real difference between the cultural and economic left. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you, I mean, your cultural left will be like, oh, this is inauthentic, which is just a slang word for white, or for you, which is also degrading, too, because, you know, white insinuates that white people are all the same. And I'm like, no, no, I'm sorry, man. Danes and Italians have differences. Yeah, also, even if you grow up 
near somebody and your basic identity markers are the same as them, you're not necessarily like them. For instance, I know a dude who went to the same college I went to, broadly similar background in terms of his family and all that, you know, straight white guy, blah, blah, blah. I went to the same college at the same major. I defy you to find anything we actually have in common beyond those superficial things. Let me explain his <laughs> worldview. He was a hardcore, ardent Baptist. Uh, he was the guy who could name whatever year his Baptist church adhered to. Um, he believed he did not believe in women's rights. He did not believe women should be allowed to vote, for instance. Um, he also thought there were only three cultures in the history of the world which had any validity or merit. That is modern-day America, Japan, and Israel. Everything else is trash, including Greece and Rome. He said of the Roman Empire, and I quote, It's nothing more than a thousand years of butt sex, and it reached its peak under Constantine, who finally got things together. <laughs> God damn. I mean, okay, but in theory, he and I should have things in common, based on the identity theory of how society works. We do not. At all. I mean, the only thing we had in common is that I found some of his stuff fascinating because it was so far afield that I would just always ask him questions to figure out what he thinks about stuff. No one else would talk to him. I also figured that if I talked to him more and he thought he had a friend, he'd be less likely to become a mass shooter. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but I got some really interesting insights that I don't think any other human being could have possibly produced. Um, he, uh, he also, oh yeah, his dad, by the way, ran for Congress in 2010 as a Tea Partier, but as a Tea Party Democrat running to the right of a conservative Republican. Oh, yeah, yeah, you told me about that. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, we're talking about some extreme levels of eccentricity here. I mean, I feel like I could make a whole video just on this guy. Probably should, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe, like a Patreon exclusive. Uh, maybe if I could look yeah, him up. Because I know he also predicted the Space Force, oddly enough, because he said his ambition in life was to be an Air Force general who would then take over Space Command. No, I think, um, I, I do think that um, identity left, probably its biggest problem is that it, sure, it can win some cultural battles, but um, as far as creating a workable political coalition, it's a fucking failure. Um, yeah, it and, just doesn't, it doesn't appeal to enough people. Um, because the fact is, if you're, if you're not in whatever little group that they're trying to cheerlead for at that moment, you have very little incentive to help them out. And they offer you nothing. Yes, yes. Particularly uh, particularly the current version in particular, which has a... Um, I gotta say, like, is more antagonistic um, towards other groups, right? Like, there's... Um, uh, the current a lot of the form of identity politics um, sounds like it's this is very antagonistic towards like you know your straight white males, <clears throat> so it just can't really like it's hard to win over adherence on that point. I mean, it just um, I say sound like I mean fuck it is man you know I mean they write things like you know like uh like the person that writes She Hulk's got like you know the white guy's guide to literature or some crap you know what I mean it's like oh great I. I love being reduced down to a label. That's beautiful. And also, you know? Uh, I know that there was one thing I saw, I think it was by the YouTuber Steve Shibes, where he was trying to adhere to some challenge to make sure that half of the books on his shelf were written by women. Or yeah, whatever it was. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I just never give a shit about that stuff. Well, so, I, depending know. on what you study, that can be very hard to do, even if you if you tried to set out to do that. Because... There are a fair number of women who do ancient history, and I have a lot of their books when they write about something that I'm interested in or that I can afford, because that's also an issue with ancient books. But uh, for, especially with stuff I've been working on my dissertation, the military stuff, there actually are a few ancient military historians who are women, but you probably won't be surprised. Most of them are men. So if I'm actually going yeah. to look up the stuff I need to look up, I have to read mostly male authors. There's not really any getting around that. And count on one hand, how many female American Civil War historians I know who aren't just dealing with culture, who will deal with military topics? Not many. Um, yeah, I just, 
that kind of stuff is uh, it's ridiculous. It's a quota. It, it's sad. It's just, it's like racism. It, uh, it, it's a political. It's it's a political failure. It, it'll never succeed. It yeah. can only really divide. It, it doesn't have the ability to unite and create a working coalition, which is why I know conservatives are all terrified and say like, "Oh my God, the demographic time bomb is here, and we're all going to lose." I'm like, I don't know, man. I just keep getting a strong feeling conservatives are about to have a very good decade. I don't know what yes. it is. Um... Maybe- I, I, fucking wrong. One thing. Certainly, demographics are destiny. I'm wrong, but it, I don't know. There's something tells me that they're going to be able to tap into something right now, especially with the current crisis. One thing they have going for them is that they'll probably be in control when the census is taken, and uh, that will give them a, a decades long, a decade long advantage. And who knows, man? Like I told you before, if they, um, if if they can become even. More more mildly critical of capitalism than say a, a guy like Romney was a slave to it. Uh, they can be very persuasive. Yeah, actually, um, my gut feeling, and I I can't back this up right now with evidence, but my gut feeling is that the decade is lost already. Wow. Um, especially because it, I'm thinking about how long is it going to take for progressives to boot out the establishment? It's going to take a while. It's not going to be an well, easier short fight, and. Oh, no, you, you never will be able to. It, it, over. It, yeah, I mean, uh, so by I think the most optimistic I can be is that we might see changes by twenty thirty. No, no, you're. Um, I, I'm, I'm firmly set. You're, you're on a clock for Imperium. You know, we're already an oligarchy. We've been an oligarchy for a while. The powers that be are so entrenched. You couldn't really pull off a revolution right now. Civil War is probably off the cards. <clears throat> it's essentially just going to become a contest between rich assholes to decide which 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 rich asshole will be at the top of the rich asshole heap. And uh, we're just going to become like uh, it's going to become a dictatorship or an empire. I'm pretty convinced on that one. I, I got me. I could be could be wrong, and weird shit does happen. I mean, if I went to somebody in 1985 and told them where we'd be right now, they'd think I was talking science fiction, probably. Uh, but yeah, also, um, I, I, I don't see how you're going to fix anything, man. Everybody's paid off. Money talks, bullshit takes the bus. Yeah, I guess literally. Um, <laughs> yeah. At least when public transportation is properly funded, otherwise they walk. Mm. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, I, speaking of random political uh, news that is of a negative variety, do you hear that Larry Summers is now Joe Biden's chief economic advisor? No, oh, I mean I'm I'm paying very little attention. I mean it, it's 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 Joe Biden. He's the credit card company's best friend. I already know I'm fucked. Yeah, he um, I I think he's because everybody's comparing his campaign with 2016. I suggest you compare it to 2004. I think he's huh. running. I think he's doing a repeat of Kerry more so than Hillary in a lot of ways. Yeah, what way? Well, he's running against an incumbent, a person who is beatable. And rather than running against the actual weaknesses of that candidate, he is trying to obscure the differences between them policy-wise and run on character and personal popularity, which I guess could be either Hillary or Kerry. And um, he's basically he, basically his argument is um, things will be the same but better because I won't be on Twitter. I'm not racist, and uh, you know, look, the people around me are more competent than the people around him. That's really what his appeal comes down to. And then he, he's also trying to do this Democratic pride thing because apparently he hasn't heard how many people have left the party and how most people don't really give a shit about their party identity. At least that they're at least they're not like out celebrating the fact that they're Democrats every day. Um, so he is running a campaign which reminds me a lot of 2004. You've got a really good point there. That does sound like 2004. Only maybe more incompetence? I mean, Carrie well, yeah, could... Finish. Well, Carrie didn't have dementia. <laughs> that helped. Carrie can finish complete sentences. Uh, Carrie was a pretty good debater. Um, I thought he was a shit debater, actually, because I remember people talking about how good of a debater he was, and I watched him with Bush, and he was just boring as all hell and made very thought, few points. I do think John Kerry's a good public speaker, though. Like, when he wants to. Yeah, he can be. The thing is, he was running on that generic Democrat strategy, which I, I have friends who defend that, and they say it makes sense because polls say people like generic Democrats. 
how do you get somebody to that stature and that level of fame to become a nominee who is a generic Democrat? If you live, say, 60 back. years, you're going to do things which will make you a specific human. You know? You're not going to be a generic oh. person. Going back to Star Trek, though, those people who say that are Spock, and I'm McCoy who says, that doesn't speak to the soul, man. That doesn't speak to the blood, you know what I mean? It also just isn't possible. I mean, I think even Spock would observe that, well, if you married the heir to a ketchup fortune, that's not an experience <laughs> shared by very many people. If you won two purple hearts, that is not a very common experience. None of these things add up to being just a generic, everyday Democrat. It just I love the ketchup fortune thing, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's bizarre. And then it's also, like, there are very few people that age, uh, I guess he was in his late 50s at the time, who are snowboarders. Um, so if you reach that level of success and somebody gets to know you, you will have characteristics which are not generic. There will be yeah. things about your life that are not generic. There is no such thing as a generic Democrat. That's an abstract concept, just like an, a generic Republican. They do not actually exist. You can't That'd find one and put them on the ballot. You can't because That'd they're be not you. fucking existing. You say what you will, man. Trump is him. I mean, of course he would talk about disinfectant injection, right? Yeah. Um, even my mom, who I think kind of supports Trump tacitly, even she thought that that recent press conference was an embarrassment. Yeah, though I liked one thing he said about uh, supply chain. I mean, yeah, I have just produce stuff here. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, like, I've long thought that. I and mean, for me, it's a duh thing, right? It's one of the only things that I like about Trump is he will talk about stuff like that. I'm like, yes, yes, we should make shit here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like like I was say, like, you know, like, uh, I disagree with Trump 80% of the time, which, as far as Republicans go, is on the high, is on the low end. Yeah. So trade wise, yeah, I agree with him. No, I think um on on the issues on the issues of trade and also domestic production, I think he's actually to the left of Biden a little bit. He's to the he's way to the left of Biden. I mean, Biden's the kind of guy who would definitely have, you know, everything built in China because it's cheaper for his, you know, cocksucker wealthy friends. Because I mean he is a credit card guy. I don't know. Yeah, no, um <laughs> that's that's the whole thing too. I, I feel like the, the general election is shaping up to be a Republican primary. Yeah. Um, because we, it literally is a Republican primary. If you just look at the choices we have, I don't, because people are talking about, well, you can do harm reduction with Biden. Uh, basically it's more of a pick your poison, even more than a lesser of two evils. Do you want somebody it's, who's worse on this issue or worse on that issue? That's really your choice. Well, I try to tell them that the problem with the harm reduction argument, and I understand the logic of it, but it does not speak to the soul. It doesn't inspire. It's by its nature depressing. Yeah, not only that, but uh, it's hard to point to too many areas of harm reduction that you actually get. Uh, and there are some, because I'm thinking, I'm trying to weigh out the dangers in terms of likelihood of occurrence. So, for instance, um, could Trump, in theory, threaten Roe versus Wade? Sure. How likely is that? I'm not sure. Could Joe Biden try to revive the grand bargain? He could. What's the likelihood? I'm not sure. But if he actually pulled that off, that would do a lot more harm than repealing Roe versus Wade. He could try for it. I don't think that one would happen. I think I, th I think the grand bargain is off the table for. Now. I, I think a so. diluted a diluted grand bargain though could happen, like, but not not the one Obama tried to strike in two thousand eleven. Not that one. Yeah. Because I I, th I think we've become just a little too. We've become a little more left in economics since then. So I think anybody, I think even a, if Biden doesn't recognize his advisors would have to recognize that would be political suicide, which is one of the reasons why nobody ever messes with this stuff anyway. Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, choosing between Biden and Trump is, is like if an ambidextrous boxer comes up to you and tells you to pick <laughs> a hand and you have to take a punch in the face from one or, or the other hand, but he's ambidextrous so no matter what you choose you are fucked and you're getting knocked out there's a lot of truth in that i will say the harm reduction thing to me makes a lot it doesn't make as much sense an identity issue as if you really look at it trump hasn't really done anything anti-gay in fact no he, actually he doesn't give a shit about that issue no he doesn't and the whole thing too is if he were to go after gay people in some way i think that would create a backlash 
And I think he's aware of that and would not risk that. Because I think he's aware of the fact that, at this point, pretty much all Democrats agree on gay issues. And half of the Republicans who voted for Trump are also basically pro-gay or at least neutral on the issue at this point. It would be completely pointless for him to go after gay people. It would backfire yeah. horribly. And he never cared anyway. No, he doesn't. Not at he all. He doesn't care. Um, so that's why... Yeah, we're, we're... yeah. Go ahead, sorry, man. I was just going to say, I don't think that's a realistic fear at this point. Um, unless he were to have a Big Mac heart attack and then Mike Pence is president. But even then, Pence at that point would be a first-term president. He'd be looking to get reelected. So he probably also would have the sense not to act on his impulses. Yeah, yeah. No, man, like, I think um, where the harm reduction makes the most sense is probably the environment. Yes. I'll start talking that. about it. Uh, the, the place actually okay. makes more sense than with the presidency. The people who have really done the most damage in American politics over the last decade have been governors. That's where the harm reduction argument really works. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, oh yeah, no, I completely agree with that, man. Because the more you get to the presidency, um, I can't put this way, just, man, like, on a local level, you can get some very much more radical change, one way or the other. A lot of crazy experiments get tried out locally, statewide, county, whatever it might be, you know? But yeah, the harm reduction thing, I think, makes more sense than, um, yeah, I love how our Civil War things become a discussion about Biden versus Trump, which is fucking sad, you know? No, it is. Uh, I guess it is a new civil war, although it's one that's a very, very sad imitation of the original. Um, because basically, two representatives of a failing political system, um, and I guess in a lot of ways our, our system is as failing as the system of the 1860s, just less dramatically so. Yeah, there's also like, I mean, you know, in some ways we're less violent people it's it's not quite as strictly sectional as that one was um but well, it's, it's yeah, a city I, I versus rural though i mean it is sectional in its own way yeah uh, yeah and it very very no very true you know it just that it's yeah it's like a boring crappy civil war in a way yeah was it mark said first is tragedy then is farce <laughs> oh okay, because... god you're right fuck Oh my god, I didn't even think of that. Because we're going... now now we're talking about a choice between two men, one who definitely has dementia, one who is so stupid it doesn't matter where he has dementia or not. Um, neither has ideas. Both are, you know, running administrations full of crooks, criminals, and assholes. And then we're supposed to make a logical choice between two people who logically should not be on the ballot. Or anywhere near power. I'm gonna give you a c I'm gonna give you an esoteric aside on tragedy and farce thing. so there's a historian named marilyn b young she wrote a book about you know, the vietnam war it's absolutely terrible um very hard left uh extremely extremely slanted and biased if you ask me so anyway but she had this part where she talks about dnb and foo you know the french fought hard there especially the paratroopers there's a passage where she has a par french paratrooper talking about how hard they fought you know? Right. And the other guy dismisses him and says, whatever, we beat you. And she's trying to say, what she's doing is she's undermining the romantic vision of war. Okay? And I mention that because when you're saying this stuff's farcical, if I go back to the American Civil War, even if you absolutely hate the South and hate the Confederacy, you really gotta, like, love dramatic moments. Like when a guy like Armistead Gettysburg puts his hat on his sword and says, you know, Come with me, and then when they're near there, he says, "Give him the cold steel." Right? Yeah. I mean, that's dramatic, passionate. You can respect the courage at least. And this farcical shit, yeah, nothing like that. There is no Armistead putting their hat in the fucking sword. Okay. Yeah, it's just you know? somebody being like, "Well, uh, I guess I'll vote for Biden." Uh. Yeah, but there, there is, there is zero thing if. There's nothing inspiring about this stuff at all. It's a fucking joke, man. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, a harm reduction theory. I think it's. I think it would favor Biden, but 
problem with harm reduction theory is that it's not inspiring. And that's the thing about Obama in 2008. As an inspiring person, people are happy to vote for him. Now, my Republican people said, only because he's black. And I'm like, okay, for some people, yes. Other people, it's different. I just liked hearing a Democrat talk about being a Democrat proud and loud. Yes. Um, also, I was under the impression that Obama was a lot more progressive than he was back in 2008. Because I was actually a little bit skeptical at first. My favorite person early on was Kucinich. And I only got with Obama after it was clear that Kucinich wasn't going anywhere. And it was clear yeah, that Obama might. I didn't follow politics in great deal back then, so guess who my favorite was? Who? Joe Biden. Really? <laughs> Actually, that was uh, Michael's favorite, too, at the time. It was. Me and him talked about that, man. You know, um, yeah, no, I, I liked uh, I liked Biden at that time. And um, I mean, I'm not going to scold myself. I mean, what the fuck did I know? You know what I mean? I wasn't even 30. Yeah, true. You know, you, um, you, you know it, it was based on, like, things I'd seen, interviews with him, which I know now is like, it's all bullshit, it's all show, but, you know, at the time, I didn't think of it this sort of stuff, you know? Um, but, yeah, but Obama, I wasn't, like, totally sold on him, but I definitely wasn't fucking Hillary, right? Right. But I, I, I did like the speeches. They were son, he could be firing, and, you know, he was... Yeah, but he wasn't that progressive. I mean, it's funny how many failed to see that and what's really funny is people like Cheney saw that and made fun of us for it. They were right. And maybe that's one of the reasons why like, I don't look at Republicans and make fun of them or think, oh, you're a bunch of idiots because I'm like, no, no, no. Trust me. There are things they know that we don't know. I yeah. said, my father could be wrong about lots of stuff, but one thing he was right about, my father said, son, you're voting for Democrats because you think they care about you economically. He said, they don't. Also rich assholes. <laughs> right yeah he uh nailed that one and go get me wrong my father republican to the bone right i'm going through his apartment you know and i'm finding like mitt romney shit every was that he his really last major romney. political hero or he really like mitt romney dude there's no john mccain stuff there. he really like mitt romney and ronald reagan he actually got a personal personally made leather bound book of ronald reagan quotations how did yeah. your dad feel about Trump? Barely spoke about him, really. Um, he kind of seemed embarrassed. Like I would, like I didn't even really ask him too much because I didn't like talking politics with him. But I, it came a few times, and he just had this look of embarrassment because uh, my father, Republican as he was, there were certain things about him that would perfectly align with the left, especially identity left. So, for instance. This idea we have right now that everybody in Hollywood's a bunch of like rapists. My dad said my whole life. Everybody in Hollywood's a bunch of rapists. They molest children. They're absolutely morally disgusting and repugnant. And so there are certain things that identity politics left people will say where I'm like, my God, that sounds like my dad. Yeah. Um, and and, my unless dad. the accusation's against someone with a D next to their name, in which case it's untrue. <laughs> Oh, like Jeffrey Epstein. I knew about Jeffrey Epstein years ago. My dad told me about him. He said, yeah, Bill Clinton flies around a plane with this Jewish guy named Epstein, and they just molest children together. Holy shit. How long ago was that? 2000, 2001. Wow. He also said Kevin Spacey. He said Kevin Spacey also molests people, children, younger age people. Although apparently uh, uh, Kevin Spacey was also doing that to grown men on sets. I mean, they got a dick, right? You know? Yeah, no, I, no, Kevin Spacey, um, I'm surprised there wasn't somebody who wrote an article trying to say that it was like the empowerment of the LGBTQ community. Uh, I'm surprised there wasn't at least one person who tried to take that line of argumentation. But, uh... uh Spacey, Spacey was fucking done, man. But I worked in the worked in some film... You know, I know people in the film industry. I mean, not like high level, but enough people to know that Kevin Spacey was fucked. You know? But... Stuff like that, or, you know, like rape, right? Yeah. Like, uh, my father was very, like, that's rape, don't do that kind of shit, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he had a very strict definition of rape that would perfectly align with identity politics. You know what I mean? 
I guess, uh, so, uh, though, to be fair, uh, um, you know, your dad was a regular guy rather than a powerful guy. So, I mean, he uh, he never was in a position where he could get away with some insane act. Uh, you know, so all regular people pretty much probably have about the same idea of what would constitute rape and what would be appropriate or inappropriate in terms of the liberties you can take with another person. Yeah, I can see what you mean there. I can see what you mean there. I, I think also just my father had a deep distrust of elites but i think the reason why he trusted conservative elites over liberal ones is he felt that liberal ones hated him for being a straight white male finger wagged and that they were full of shit i think that last one is something i do agree with him on that a lot of liberal elites talk a good game but honestly they're full of shit like you know like save the environment my private jet my limousine later bro you know <laughs> yeah uh, that kind of stuff. It's like, women's rights are great, but like, man, you got some big titties and I want to touch them right now and I'm powerful so I can do that. Yeah, but you know, if you're a man who isn't rich and famous, you're a rapist and you're going to jail. So honestly, when hashtag me too happened, my dad actually was having a gay old time. He thought it was hilarious. <laughs> like, like he, I, he, he was like, he, he was, for him it was like, my God, I'm finally vindicated. <laughs> Like, yes, everybody in media are just a bunch of sexual degenerates who all belong in jail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, he said this shit for decades, you know, so... Um, yeah, just so that that's... That's one of those things that uh, I, I I don't... Um, well, of course, I'm favoring the left. Um, conservatives will not only always be there, but they have a place there, and there are things they can teach you if you're willing to listen even though I don't agree with them at heart. Right. No. That's also because all of us are part liberal, part conservative. We're human. Only fanatics want to wipe everything out themselves. Fanatics are the ones who are afraid that some part of them might be this or that. I mean, that's what a fanatic is. <laughs> yeah, they want to uh, wipe away everything on Arrakis, except for their own order. Arrakis? Oh my god, you're quoting David Lynch Dune here? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going there. But anyway, man. it's been a long, weird, rambling conversation. Um, hope your audience liked it. Uh, this, is, this is what quarantine does to the human mind. It ain't so bad. It ain't so bad. I've got a great quarantine plan, man. You know, you see, you, you talk to people online, phone, or you see them in person at a distance. You know, make sure you don't go socially crazy. Read some books. Do some writing. Have your hobbies set aside. Take long walks like I did earlier. You know? Yeah. There's some you don't new go bike near. trails near where I live that I had no idea existed. I've also been drinking the entire time. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I don't know. I guess I haven't done that much drinking, relatively speaking, just because I've had to do a lot of writing. Oh. So, uh, Three quarters of a bottle of wine and about uh, two or three... Uh, Eat drinks of this Basil Hayden whiskey, which tastes real good. Yeah. Basil Hayden, yep. huh? Basil Hayden's, man. It's good stuff, you know? I know the only got... liquor store near me that's open is the one in Kroger, and I feel like uh, that is a place where you'd be very likely to catch COVID-19. Um, <laughs> because there are a lot of people in there. It's known for robberies. A lot of people call it Kroghetto, and... For me to get in to get liquor, I have to stand in this long line to get in the liquor store area. So last time I oh. went there, I got two big ass bottles, one of gin and one of whiskey. And basically, I told Tina, you know, this is going to have to last us until regular stores reopen because I'm not going back through that. I just stand in line for an hour to get that shit. Holy shit, man! Yeah, dude, around here it's everywhere, man. All of our convenience stores have them. Our gas stations, man. You go to a gas station, New Orleans, you can get fucking drunk. But as we say, this is the land of civilized drinking. Well, that well, Kentucky is the land of uh, alcoholism because you know they can buy anything there. It is the land of alcoholism. Oh fuck it, dude! You remember Kentucky? Like you could buy you could buy whiskey in any store, CVS, True. Walgreens. I mean, I'd, I'd be drinking with Kentuckians, and they were just lame. No, the only time you could get Kentuckians to show a sign of life is if they were very drunk. And not a little drunk, very drunk. And eh, fucking weirdos, man. Also, yeah, they were very clannish. Like, uh, Kentuckians are only friends with other Kentuckians. 
And don't even get me started on the experience of dating people in Kentucky if you're not from Kentucky. Yes, yes, I know exactly what you mean, man. Exactly. But, you know, like, yeah, I don't like Kentucky, man. But you know my theory on why Kentucky's fucked up, huh? Why is that? Civil War, man. I didn't choose a side. Yeah, and I remember Seven... uh, I was reading that one Connolly book on the Army of Tennessee, and uh, was it Kirby Smith's plan was to go to Kentucky and then he'd stomp his feet and the army would appear? I'm like, uh, and they, they had a he bunch of promises from state officials. I'm like, yeah, that was your first and fatal mistake was trusting the word of Kentuckians. That's yeah, where you really no. fucked yourself. 71% of male Kentuckians did not take part in the war as the lowest by percentage of any state during the war. Uh, fun fact about Lydell, by the way. He actually goes in his memoirs about how when they were in Kentucky, they showed restraint. They didn't like these food or anything because they want to win people over. And he said nobody joined. He said, one of the biggest regrets of my life is we didn't seize food and fuck them up. Because <laughs> he's like, he actually, in this record, he's like, goddamn cowards. And I'm just like, you know what? That's one of those passages of, that's one of those passages in Lydell's record where I'm like, that is fucking beautiful and perfect. Yeah, You're right. You, all, it also yeah. reminds me, I remember every time we'd, in, we'd try to set up groups to play board games or go out or whatever it would be. And every time I'd talk to somebody who's a native Kentucky and their excuse was always they had to clean their room. That was the go-to excuse. And if uh, a, a lot of times that would be the excuse that girls would use if they wanted to cancel a date. But it was the it was the go-to over and over and over and over. That's I the gotta worst clean excuse my room. ever. That's the worst apartment. fucking excuse ever, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's But it, I, I remember hearing that every time we'd try to set something up. That's why... Um, I, I quit trying to organize things, and I always tried to put that off on you or Michael because I got sick of hearing that shit. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking weird, dude. Like, like every friend I made there, with like one exception, were not a native Kentuckian. Yes, same here. And I remember you pointed that out pretty early. You're like, "Is it just me or people aren't here fucking weird?" Um, yeah, man. I, I mean, I know some Kentuckians might be listening to us, and sorry, guys, state fucking sucks. <laughs> Although Louisville is kind of cool, I like Louisville. Louisville's, L- Louisville's the Louisville is the best part of Kentucky for sure that I went in. Yeah, and Louis- I will. Say- Louisville's kind of like a mini Portland in a way too. I mean, it's a pretty neat place, pretty unique. Yeah, yeah, I've I've been there a few times. Uh, gotten some good food there. Yeah, Louisville is. Uh, Definitely the best part of Kentucky, in my experience. There are some pretty parts of Kentucky, of course, but then again, there are pretty parts of every state. Yeah, especially Delaware. states and that are mountain states. Yeah, and Delaware, yeah. from what I understand, is hideous. South Dakota is hideous too. South Dakota, come on, they got the Black Hills, man. South Dakota is like what the moon would look like if you could grow grass. <laughs> that sounds interesting to me. <laughs> well, it's not interesting when you see it. I mean, uh, it sounds interesting until you get a good look at it and it just rolls on and on and on and on. And it's just like these <laughs> pockmarked, ugly-ass, plain hills with tall grass over and over and over for mile after mile, every every side of you. Uh, Fuck, man. <laughs> I remember driving through, and I, remember, I was about nine at the time, and that was the first time I thought to myself, this landscape is hideous. You see, I already had that experience. The first thing was going to Texas when we were kids. I was like, cross the Texas border, and we're going to San Antonio. And, you know, I'm like fucking six. I don't know how big fucking Texas is. So I thought, oh, cool. We're in Texas. San Antonio is going to be here right away. Yeah. No. It was a long drive and a very boring drive. I can remember just staring out into the death plains, the emptiness of Texas, going to San Antonio and being like, this is hell. Did, was that still the time in Texas where people had those cars with the horns on them and all that bullshit? Horns? You remember, like, every... Even in Rotor and a lot of other movies set in Texas, they'll always have cars with the uh, horns on them, hor- horns from Steer? Oh, yeah. Fuck. No, I don't remember, man. I don't remember seeing any of that stuff. I mean, we were, just, we were just driving down to San Antonio. I just remember how desolate the drive was, especially when you got past Houston. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I've yes. actually, I've never been to Texas. I was actually conceived in Texas, but I've never been there. Oh, okay. Well, you know where you're conceived. All right, man. Cool. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I can figure it out by context because uh, I was born after a few months of being in Georgia. So, and the previous Wait. place my parents were was San Antonio. So there you go. I can figure that oh, out. San- not Waco. Okay, I got you. No, not <laughs> no, not Waco. San Antonio. Yeah, man. So, uh, the fucking desolation of Texas. That's when I was like, this is a. Apparently, it also has flying cockroaches near the border. What, the Texas-Mexico border? Yeah. And they're flying cockroaches here in New Orleans. That sounds pretty scary. Yeah, I haven't had them do that in a long, long time, but there'll be random times, like, uh, across the river, like, they go, like, the thing is, when they fly, too, is they look like they don't fly very well, so they're just, like, hovering. They always feel like they're hovering right towards you, you know? By the way, audience, I need you to understand something. Uh, you may hear the word cockroach and be like, oh my god, your apartment's dirty. No. And in New Orleans, every home has a roach show up at least once a year. That's if you're lucky. Okay, they're all over the place around. Okay, like, 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 if you're in a New Orleans suburb, like uptown area and whatnot, and you lean on an oak tree, don't do it. They're covered in roaches. A lot of them. You know? fall out of the fucking trees and hit you in the head sometimes. By the way, I don't want to totally terrify you. It's That's not super common, but it does happen. So, yeah, don't think like, you know, when I'm saying roaches and everybody's filthier. Which yeah, Sean, is, you're, uh, you're hard selling New Orleans there. I mean, you're in tour guide mode. Talking about the yeah, roaches falling off the trees. Well, I mean, like, hey, I, I can sell you in New Orleans. Just, you know, just understand roaches are around, you know. Hey, you know, we got uh, bars open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, leap year covered, uh, all holidays covered. I know bars are open Christmas, Thanksgiving, years, uh, of course, and uh, 4th of July and everything, you know? Um, yeah. It's lots of street musicians. Nobody gives a shit. It's pretty chill here, you know, overall. Yeah. In New Orleans can shit and spit you out, but uh, for the most part, pretty calm around here, you know? Yeah, I remember it's a pretty cool place. It's not, I mean, I've only got to be there a few days when I visited, but uh, definitely different than anywhere else I've ever been. Um, very distinctive. Yeah, yeah. If it, and less distinctive now than it was 20 years ago and definitely less distinctive than 50 or 60. But yeah, distinctive, man. We just, we have our own thing. No yeah. fuck. <laughs> it's, no, uh, that's actually- also, uh, Bourbon Street was, uh, it was a, I guess it would be like a stereotype in my mind of like a modern Sodom or Gomorrah. Yeah, God, it's <laughs> disgusting. No, it is. Oh. Like I remember, I I was able because I you know I have really good eyesight. I have like maybe twenty fifteen vision. I was able to spot three or four porn stores in a row going down that little alley that's Bourbon Street. <laughs> you know, like, just in sight, right? And I'm like, holy shit, man. And then there were, you know, it was like a traveling musician with like a cart with uh, drums and other instruments on it. And I'm like, man, this is a, this is a full on party town. And it's also a party town. It's party town where you can still party past the age of 22 or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point you make there, man. Like, people here are fucking partying in their 40s and 50s. Oh, yeah, I remember you went out to that one bar and you had that friend there, uh, some toothless dude who was, you know, he, I think he said by day he's in his story and then by night he crawls bars, you know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say toothless? <laughs> There's one, yeah, one guy you introduced me to who's talked about doing history. He didn't have very many teeth from what I recall. Oh, Miko. I mean, uh, maybe that was his name. I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, that was Miko, man. Miko's Miko's a good guy. He's yeah, a good, he's a dude, good dude, but no, dude, he's he's a fucking fantastic writer. He uh, he wrote a book called New Orleans Rum, which is just you know, history of New Orleans with some rum thrown in. His own observations. It's actually very well written, very fun. Most of his like ninety percent of his facts are right, which is great for a New Orleans history book because New Orleans history books gonna be full of we just love our bullshit, you know. And no, I can. I, there you go, everybody. If you're still listening to our fucking rambles right now, uh, look up New Orleans Rum by Miko. That is M I K K O, and his last name, which I won't try to pronounce because it's long and everything. But look it up. Very good introductory book to New Orleans. Very very fun read. His facts. I mean, he's got ninety ninety five percent of them right. So I can highly recommend. It was a fun thing to read. And yeah. Nico is a great guy, and yes, he has no teeth. 
don't know how he lost them, but he lost all of his teeth. I hope there's a really good story, you know, like uh, he got in a really intense bar fight with somebody who was tangentially famous. Like some, <laughs> some actor who was on an up-and-comer, very specifically only in 1989, and only yeah. for the first six months. So it was one of those stories which would have become a national story if only that person had, had been in the successful movie. <laughs> It's fucking great, man. Um, but yeah. No, man. No, it's, it's, it, no you, you, you can meet some characters around here, and uh, people are pretty loose. Mardi Gras is a lot of fun, you know? Um, and uh, I'll say I'll say one one other thing, though, about that. Uh, is people were, like, uh, calling me up and saying things like, oh, isn't New Orleans a hot spot for coronavirus? I'm like, it was for a little while. Our curve has, our, our curve has flattened a lot. Like yesterday, we had like twenty new cases in the city. That's definitely um, good. Well, when they told us to stay at home, we did it fast. We did it hard. We're a community-based people, so people don't want to look like they're not following the rules. It's the biggest small town in America, as they say, probably a good thing. And um, other people would send me messages and say, "Isn't the French Quarter overrun with rats?" I had my friend in Germany. She sent me that message. No, French Quarter is not overrun with rats. So few of the restaurants are open, the rats are gone. They went uptown. They went to the suburbs. Friends who live out in those areas, they're seeing rats. <laughs> not here in the French Quarter. Very few rats at all. Well, I guess you made the right housing choice, then. I did, man, I did. But then, because the fucking restaurants are closed. If you're a rat, you're going to go where the food is. And there ain't that much food around here right now. Although we still have... Places doing to-go orders, you know, fantastic restaurants like Galatoire's, greatest restaurants in the world, you know, a uh, variety of other places. It's a good place to eat, everybody. Okay, so I can't sell you on cockroaches. I shouldn't, but I can sell y'all on the fact that we have lots of live music. We, more importantly, have lots of bars open 24 hours a day. We're a loose city. People generally don't give a shit. The food is really good here. We ate great places to enjoy chill out and we have beautiful architecture too and lots of old fantastic buildings you know so there is my new orleans tourism speech and tonight. you also do give tours um through free tours by foot so it is true man. people can look you up and get tours of graveyards or other things and also i guess you don't do ghost tours anymore though i can do those if somebody requests them their thing i, I know a few things like uh, good stories, but yeah, I do a tour of anything. Although funny, you said graveyards. We never use that word around here. Cemetery. Ah, uh, cemetery. Everything's called a cemetery here. Uh, I know what you mean, though. But a graveyard always has the connotation of burial. You know. Yeah. We throw people into it. I mean, we not always. Sometimes we bury in the. Ground. A lot of times you throw into a tomb, you seal it up, so hot inside the tomb, that they decay quickly, and that's how why New Orleans tombs hold like. 20, 30, 40. There's one tomb that has, I know of, that has 97 people. Yeah. And uh, is Nicholas's Cage, Nicholas Cage's Pyramid still available at uh, St. Louis Cemetery Number 1? Nicholas Cage dies today from coronavirus, buried in New Orleans. A pyramid-shaped tomb, St. Louis Cemetery Number 1. And I think it's designed after the aesthetic used in the original National Treasure movie, right? It is totally, man. As a Latin phrase, um, from many one or from everything one, he it's like with omni, oh. it says like omni ab uno. Oh, everything that, from one. Everything from one. Thank you, sir. You know your Latin. So, everything from one. Yeah, Nicholas Cage dies today. That is where he gets buried. Yeah, but also <laughs> uh, the this backstory that's pretty funny too. And uh, also, I like how the Catholic Church at first said the cemetery has been closed for a hundred years. We can't bury you here. And uh, Nicholas Cage persisted and kept asking, "Well, how much do you want?" And eventually, he came up with a number. And then the Archbishop was like, "All right, sold." Yes. Now, uh, okay, let's be honest. You can be buried there. The the, the Archdiocese is very much like, "Oh my God, you don't." Know, Buried here, but hey, when you pay enough money, the Catholic Church is going to say yes, because the Catholic Church is not doing well financially. I've heard. Yeah, I mean, uh... yep. So who knows what happens from necessarily? But anyway, 
we should probably call a close to things. I yeah. probably drank drank a little too much. We've rambled on almost an extra hour about almost nothing related to the American Civil War at all. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, hopefully people will find this amusing, and uh, I don't. I guess they probably won't gain anything of value from it, but hopefully they will be marginally entertained oh. for an hour. Oh, come on. They may have learned that Nicolas Cage we buried in New Orleans, that bars are open 24 hours a day here, that the people of Covington, Kentucky, apparently talk like Yankees, and then when you get to Cincinnati, they start talking like Southerners, right? Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that these are the things that people really subscribe to this channel for. At least that would be what my comment section suggests. I think your comment section suggests they went Byzantine emperors... Yeah, they Every, say that a lot, too. Why do they want... I'm sorry, before we go, why the fuck do they want so many Byzantine emperors? I don't know, man. Actually, then, it's, it's sort of a mystery to me, like, which videos uh, sometimes take off and become really popular and which ones don't. Um, because those old videos I did, the lecture videos I had to basically rush through because I was teaching a course, those consistently get the most views, even on random days, over two years after the release, a lot of them get 100 views a day. Um, and Ow. those are ones I did not put that much effort into because I couldn't. Um, I had to pump these things out to keep the class going. And... Yeah, but the topics are broad enough, I guess. Yeah, it could I know be. For, I know for Forgotten Battles channel, um, what gets views is three words. World War Two. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, people can't oh, get enough you. World War Two. They, 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 that, I will say, man, that is the one of the biggest costs of my life. Higher life, people cannot get enough of World War Two. I agree. I mean, yeah. History Channel used to be the World War Two channel and occasionally a few other things. I mean, think about the obsession right now. Like, if people throw around the words like fascist and communist easily. Hitler's still the biggest villain ever. I mean, he could be replaced. He will be replaced eventually. Yeah. Once we get a global dictator or something like that. Right. Or somebody could kill more people or, you know, do, do whatever. Right. I mean, you know, there's, there's that theory that like, um, you know, the difference between a guy like Hitler and Caesar is Caesar was thousands of years ago. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess Caesar did have an exterminationist policy in Gaul, but he also, and he also did overthrow his state, but the circumstances there are a little more, extenuating than the ones that Hitler operated under because Caesar I, Caesar was not the only guilty party. I, I I definitely I definitely agree with you on that. I just mean that, you know, Hitler seems so evil to us. I mean one thing, I mean he is fucking horrible, but he's also so recent. Yeah. And he's also very specific to us. We fought against him. We didn't fight against Genghis Khan though, did we? Nope. Nope. Or that's why there's a, like, I've run to restaurants, like, I ran to a Chinese restaurant, Genghis Khan Chinese restaurant, to which I was like, wait, wait, Genghis Khan Chinese restaurant? Yeah. I mean, what the <laughs> right? But the part of me is like, of course he was going to protest this. It's Genghis Khan. We didn't fight against him. He's from thousands of years ago. Maybe if it's the Yuan Dynasty Chinese restaurant, then you could possibly work that, but uh, even yeah. that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, but so no. it's just. Yeah, I know. It's just like, so you, you do a World War II video, everybody fucking tunes in, man. Also, yeah, uh, that, that was my other series that does well consistently. Those uh, World War II neutral videos I made a long time ago. Before this was channel never, really got anywhere. You're good, man. I do predict if you do all the Roman emperors, you get a lot of viewers. You know, Byzantine stuff, it's interesting because I don't know much about it. But also, I don't like the Byzantine Empire. I'm just yeah. like, what the fuck? Who cares? Like, I don't know, man. Anyway, well, sorry. anyway, uh, one, one thing I have noticed is that um, there's a lot of people who complain there's not enough medieval material available online, but I know when I randomly search around for what other people on YouTube do history-wise, I mean, I find that it's hard to find ancient stuff. Yeah. So I guess, I guess it's a largely a perception issue of what you're looking for in terms of what you find lacking or abundant, because I don't think there's much ancient stuff. Especially ancient Greek stuff. There's very little. At least... More Roman than than Greek, right? Yeah, more Roman than Greek for sure. Um, and even with the Roman stuff, a lot of it is very sort of broad strokes. So that's why I like to go into detail. Because yeah. no one else does it, really. I mean, 
not often at least well i also have noticed at least um amongst the um conservative intellectuals that i follow have uh, not all of them but many of them have a, a big appreciation of ancient history yeah, and a lot of them also uh, believe that ancient history tells us that democracy is bad because, uh, you know, the rich guys who lived back then wrote that it was bad and therefore they were right because they said so. <laughs> also, I had somebody write on one of my videos and need to read Aristotle to learn how to think properly. <laughs> Eric, have you read Aristotle? I have, actually, yes. Um, <laughs> I've also read Plato and... Um, but you're more of a Platonist, right? Do what? You're more of a Platonist, right? Yeah, I, I actually um, I like Plato's constructions of argument better than I do Aristotle's because Aristotle tends to he he doesn't tend to state his assumptions as clearly, and he also tends to have very dry arguments in terms of not understanding that a lot of arguments, or at least parts of them, are rooted in irrational assumptions. Whereas Plato is pretty good at pointing out that some ideas people have are things based on assumptions they've always held that they've never even been aware of. So in that sense, ah. I find Plato much more interesting in terms of being a thinker. If we look at their conclusions, Aristotle's make more sense usually. But in terms of methodology, I think Plato has the edge. Mm. I, I, I like uh, Diogenes better than both of them myself. Yeah, he goes up to Alexander comes up to him. He's like, "Can you get out of my son?" Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a fucking great story, man. The Alexander man, he's just full of great stories, you know. Yeah, that. And, um, also, Diogenes apparently managed to seduce a young aristocratic girl who wanted to go live with him as a homeless person and uh, do philosophy, and that's why the Corinthians hated him because. Uh, uh, I. I I'm sorry, go ahead, man. My bad. Because before that, they kind of tolerated them because, you know, it's like, oh, this is our local Socrates equivalent who's just this amusing, charming uh, dick weirdo. Yeah, this guy who jerks off in public and stuff, and we kind of tolerate it because it's distinctive, and we can point him out to visitors, and he's an attraction. And then, all of a sudden, you know, some aristocratic girl who was bound to be married to somebody important falls in love with them. All right, this is a problem. You know, <laughs> shit's going down now. This is not happening. No, yeah, man, that would be that would be standard in New Orleans. Like you're like I'm like you're like so I'm like wait, there's a young aristocratic girl falls in love with some weird old dude. He says that he's gonna teach her some wisdom while he's jerking off in public. That shit happens here all the time. Yeah, I remember what was that what's that one group of assholes we ran into at that one bar where they were all sitting outside and they were dressed like goths and they told us not to smile, or what the fuck was that? I don't even remember, man. Because I remember you told me a lot of them are rich kids cosplaying as uh, something Oh, else. those people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, yeah. those aren't and those are Those are street kids. Um, street kids come in different varieties. Some of them are... Well, essentially, they are. It's like, they, you see them, they look homeless. But they're almost always white. And I don't mean white people can't be homeless, but I mean like they're white and homeless and they don't look crazy. Because, you know, you can run to a white guy who's homeless who's like fucking lost his mind. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a guy who was like schizophrenic or something. Right? Like, okay, that guy's nuts. These people who know that they know what's going on are crazy. Many of them are rich kids looking to have a poor person vacation. Some of them are also trying to get out of abusive situations, by the way. You know, like, your rich mother or father is an asshole. They're rich, they can get away with it. Yeah. When I say asshole, I don't, I don't mean like, oh, they're mean to you. I mean, like, maybe they're fucking you on the ass or something. You know what I'm saying? Maybe they're, like, 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 like physically or severely emotionally abusing you, trying to get away. So some of them are, like runaways from rich families. They figure the best way to run away is to go fucking slum it around you. Some are just fucking weirdos, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so I've kind of softened a bit about them over the months. Like, whatever. They're here. They've always kind of been here, I guess. 
And also, I don't know them so well, so I don't want to judge them and be like, oh, they're all rich kids or something, you know. But some are rich kids. Some are rich kids who ran away from home for a good reason, and some are rich kids who just have had a poor person vacation. Yeah, I know, uh, that's probably one of the few times I've actually been accosted by a rando on the street. Oh, God, that happens, that happens all the time around here. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that explains it, because I've you know, only spent a few days in New Orleans, so... Keep in mind, kids, too, he stayed in the French Quarter, okay? The French Quarter's full of fucking randos and weirdos and what the fuck ever other doe you want to think of. Um, so they're, um, you know, the French Quarter attracts those people because it's it's old, it's unusual, and there's lots of tourists here who can give money or something. Uh. Uh, yeah, big part of it, too. So, no, man. Uh, yeah, Diogenes, I gotta go with him, man. That's, that's the best yeah, he's the height of Western philosophy. It's all yes. degeneracy after Diogenes. All the de- all degeneracy. Although I, I I jokingly half jokingly tell my brother my favorite politician of all time is Caligula. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I remember uh, some people got pissed on my Roman emperor's tier list when I made Elagabalus S tier. Wait, okay. what was S tier for you? Like superior? Yeah. Um. So Elagabalus, his whole reign was he was a teenager who was a. No, no, I know. I, I know, yeah, I know. I, I, I know him. I love him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm like, well, what the hell does he think's gonna happen if you take some kid who's a religious fanatic? His hormones are raging. He's bisexual, and his religion is all about orgies. He's going to have a lot of fucking orgies. That's what he's going to do because he's got the power to do it, and he feels like he has the duty to do it. And he thinks that he's helping the Empire by keeping the Sun God happy. In his mind, he is working harder for the Empire than Augustus. But instead of using his pen, he's using his other sword. Great man. I love yeah, him. I mean, like, you know, I, if you think about the world from his perspective, what he's doing is heroic. He's taking it having... and giving it in every orifice, and he's doing it for you. Yeah, having sex on your behalf. <laughs> exactly, yes. He he is uh sucking and fucking the Romans into a better world. Yeah, there's actually like uh there's a there's an ancient coin shop around here. They sell like it's it's actually like um antique shop that and the actual sign says guns coins. Wow. And wow. uh yeah, they have a they have a, a coin coin of him in there. I thought about buying it because he's one of my favorite Roman emperors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it's safe to say that, uh, you know, he was never forced to ease back on the throttle. Uh, he he did exactly what he wanted to as emperor, and I can't honestly say it about anybody else. I mean, there are people who did a lot of what they wanted as emperor, like Nero, but Elagabalus is the only person who did exactly what he wanted every single day of his reign. And on a Good certain man. level, I respect that. Oh, I yeah, I will say the uh, the one coin, ancient coin I want is, um, the uh, Aspasian. You know, from the um, toilet stuff. Yeah. Right. Like, does it stink? Does it stink? <laughs> <laughs> no. Fuck, I'm, man. That's I'm, what my favorite Vespasian line is when he was dying, uh, he told his sons, I can feel myself becoming a god because he was mocking the policy of deifying emperors. <laughs> <laughs> I like Vespasian, man. I, he's a very practical guy. I also There's like actually- how uh, he, he got in trouble at one point and he thought Nero, he never thought Nero would give him another command because Nero would give these long singing performances and Vespasian fell asleep during one of them and Nero saw him and kicked him out. So why do we know why Nero gave him another command then? Um, he thought the Jewish war would be a long waste of time, and he also thought that because Vespasian was not as well born as a lot of other senators, that even if he had troops, they wouldn't be willing to follow him if he rebelled. Because Ves- Nero still thought that aristocratic lineage was necessary to become emperor. He well, miscalculated know. that one, huh? <laughs> yeah, he fucked that one up. And also, Vespasian probably wouldn't have rebelled, but then everybody else was doing it, and he had legions, and he actually knew what he was doing. And then his neighbor, Musianus, uh, went to him and he's like, all right, I know we've always been enemies, but right now we have to choose. Do we want a competent emperor or do we want Otho or Galba or Vitilius? 
well, we don't want any of those guys. You should just be emperor. You have a son. You can do a dynasty. I'll be your right-hand man. We got this. Let's just do it. Oh, uh, you mentioned Galba. I'm reading. Uh, I, I was reading Claudius the God, and uh, he speaks highly of Galba. Oh the, yeah, uh, that makes sense. Galba, uh, Galba was pretty well respected among his peers. Although once he became emperor, he pissed people off by being stingy and refusing to pay bonuses. Oh, okay. No, man, I liked him. He was a, he was a practical guy, and uh, I want I want to get that coin that got thrown in this. Um, the, uh, the tax for the shitters. And that's what I want. Yeah. <laughs> Does it stink? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. I guess it's had plenty of time to set in. Uh, there you uh, go, man. Caligula, Asian, and the uh, Olga. I can never pronounce it. Elagabalus. Elagabalus. I've had too much to drink. But yeah, those are my three favorites. <laughs> it's uh, quite a trio. Yeah, one practical and two nutters. <laughs> yeah. Um,. I don't know. I'm trying to think who would be my big three. Um, yeah, hard choice. I don't know. Man, it's like Indiana Jones' Last Crusade, man. You must choose, but choose wisely. Yeah, true. Um, and whichever switch you pull, there's always a chance of a scorpion falling out. True, man. Well, I'll tell you what. We should probably close things up, but before yeah. we do, you need to choose uh, your three emperors. Um, Roman. Roman. None of this bit crap. Stay with Rome. All right. Um, I'll go with... Hmm. I'm going to go with Nerva. I respect the fact that he had the sense to know that the best way to avoid a civil war is just to figure out who would win the next civil war and pick that guy as his heir. <laughs> I mean, that's actually pretty brilliant if you really think about it, right? Nerva's one of the five good emperors, but I yeah. forget, who did he pick? Trajan, because Trajan at that time ah. was the most accomplished general, and also he had the biggest army right at that moment. So Nerva knew that uh, if there was a civil war, Trajan would win, and he also knew that Trajan wanted to be emperor right then, so he just solved the problem. And he knew that if Trajan were appointed, no one would challenge him. So he helped himself by helping Trajan, and helping the empire ultimately, because there was no civil war. So Nerva... Pretty- Pretty smart isn't move. Nerva, isn't Nerva the one who sets up the idea of like you choose your successor? As yeah, opposed although to when... although it was never a formal policy, it was just that a lot of the dudes coming to the throne at that time had no sons, so it was just it just sort of happened that way. Um, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, <clears throat> no, but he not made... a formal policy, but a happy accident, if you will, because Marcus yeah, Aurelius yeah. is like, okay, Commodus will take over. It's like, what a dumb idea. Yeah, um, and my other one, I'm gonna go with. Uh, I'm actually gonna pick Commodus. Because it's amazing, it's amazing to me that this guy, whose father spent all this time cultivating his own personal virtue, spent so little time worrying about his son. And then his son's idea of virtue is, I'm going to dress up like Hercules and get in the arena and win fixed fights. I'm going to do it 400 times, and people are going to think I'm a raging badass, and I will surpass my father. He is trying to be like Plato. I'm going to be fucking Hercules. Yeah, but Hercules actually goes through labors. Hercules doesn't win fixed fights. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you must be reading a different version of Hercules' labors than the one Commodus had. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, Commodus to me is basically the Kim Jong-il or Kim Jong-un of his time. Except uh, maybe a little more approachable, unless you're a condemned man. Anyway, uh, also apparently he looked ridiculous in his Hercules outfit because it was it was designed for somebody who's very in shape, and apparently Commodus was a little on the fat side. So a lot of senators, to prevent them from laughing out loud, they'd have to put part of their toga in their mouths, and, uh, <laughs> so they have to sit there and hold in the laughter while he's storming about, stomping around with his club, talking about whatever was on his mind in the Senate, you know. Um, so Commodus makes my list for favorites, and my third one, um, Claudius. Yeah, I actually like Claudius a lot. Um, I'm gonna go with Claudius. I, I I respect him because he was someone who probably shouldn't have been emperor because he had the physical deformities, and at that time it was seen as disfavor from the gods. And Augustus wanted to hide him from the public, so he was always treated like an embarrassment and a failure for things that were beyond his control. Clearly, his family didn't 
believe in him at all, and they didn't take him seriously. And then he turned out to actually be a pretty good emperor. And he also really helped to develop a better administration of the empire. Um, you know, he was a learned man, and he also was very approachable. He didn't let power go to his head too much. He was always approachable to the people around him. He was actually really good at that imperial communication thing we mentioned hours ago uh, with Augustus and Tiberius. So even though he had never really been in politics except for a few years under Caligula, he quickly adapted to how to communicate with the Senate and did it really well. Um, and, I mean, his only real vice is that he was easily taken in by women who were trying to manipulate him. But aside from that, uh, Claudius was a good emperor. It makes sense too, man. If you're used to being like, like the loser and suddenly you're the man and women come on to you, you're, I mean, a lot of guys would be very susceptible to that. You know? Yeah. Also the woman he was really susceptible to was his niece. I forgot to mention that part. Oh, yeah, um, you know, slight detail. Agrippina the Younger was the daughter of Caligula, so. Yeah, I just, you know. Or just, wait, uh, is that right? I think, no, I don't know. Sister of Caligula, there we go. I just look, look, um, read the book, by Robert Graves, and watch TV show too. It's very well done. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, that is about three and a half hours worth of content. And I use the word content very loosely. I don't know. That was a good conversation. I hope yeah. you fucker. I, I feel like I feel like this was more like a random conversation between us that we have sometimes rather than a video. Hey, come on! There was some stuff about memoirs, there's stuff about books. I mean, we talk about that kind of shit on the phone too, though. Sometimes it's not really yeah, very, true. Yeah. very true. So this yeah, is no. if, this cool. is a, basically a day in the life, really more than uh, you know, a real uh, like a planned video. <laughs> Hey, man, hope all you quarantine motherfuckers liked it, okay? Have a good one. All right. Bye, everybody.